It's Friday, January 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, it's minus 15 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's minus 13. And here's what's making news right now. We are expecting an update from both Ottawa police and fire to that blaze at 1980 Merrillville Road yesterday afternoon. The media briefing scheduled to begin soon. Several 911 calls yesterday reported heavy black smoke at that address just after 1.30 yesterday afternoon. Just 15 minutes later, the fire service says a roof and the walls were starting to cave in. The fire fight had to be moved to a defensive position outside. The blaze was under control just before 6 o'clock last night. It is only going to get colder outside. Falling temperatures, extreme cold warning already in place for areas like Pembroke, Petawawa, Algonquin. That extreme cold warning will likely be expanded to include the Ottawa area, so watch that over the weekend as well. Now, City News meteorologist Jill Taylor says the increased moisture in the air with this storm approaching means quite a bit of snow. It's somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 30 centimeters expected. Now, this storm will begin on Sunday evening and continue into our area Monday morning. City News Time 901. Now, the Ottawa Student Transportation Authority is reminding parents to check their website for possible bus cancellations or changes. Now, that is possible on Monday, the first day back to in-class due to snow, but the USTA is more talking about COVID in this case. It warns cases of COVID could lead to disruption in service in the coming weeks. You're reminded to check the OSTA cancellation and delay page on their website. The group says it understands maintaining transportation service is critical. They're working to minimize any service impacts. You can also sign up for the group's mailing list through the parent portal once again on their website. The federal government says the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for truckers crossing into Canada from the United States will take effect on Saturday as scheduled. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos, along with the Transport and Public Safety Ministers, say the CBSA statement was provided in error. They say that Canadian truckers must be vaccinated if they want to avoid quarantine and a pre-arrival molecular test starting this weekend. The Canadian Trucking Alliance and the American Trucking Association say up to 26,000 drivers who make regular cross-border trips will be sidelined as a result of the mandate. Emily Javesky, The Canadian Press. City News Time, 9.03. While the green flags are flying on the Rideau Canal Skateway, they were uh, put up at 8 o'clock this morning, opening up the entire length of the 7.8-kilometre skateway. It's the first time the entire skateway has opened for a season in the 52nd, uh, in the 52 years it's been open, in some 20 years, first time the entire length open. NCC says users will see the return of skate rentals and food and beverage concession stands, as well as picnic tables, but it's 50% capacity there. Now, due to the current public health measures, changing facilities and fire pits, they are going to be closed. City News Time 903, and it is happening now. The draw for the Snowsuit Fund 5050. Ticket sales were cut off about 15 minutes ago, and ticket sales hit $818,845. That means the winner, going to be named very shortly, will take home a prize of $409,423. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Inform your opinion. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Uh, Friday. We made it. And the canal is open. If that's your thing. Dress for the weather and enjoy. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Great program ahead. Some great Friday fare on the way. Familiar voices, brand new voices. Lowell is going to be away for a while yet. And when he's ready to come back, he promises he'll be back. But until then, we're going to check in this morning. And we hope this uh, will become a regular part of the Friday routine around here. Tom Korski is going to join us from Blacklock's Reporter, where he is managing editor. I, ha I have been singing the praises of this small but mighty Parliament Hill news team 
for a couple of years now. I am a subscriber, and if you're really interested in the nuts and bolts of government and parliament, then you should be a subscriber too. They cover a lot of stories that I think would otherwise go unreported. And a lot of the stories that they break eventually will end up in the newspaper or on cable news. Uh, for example, there's a great front page story this morning uh, in the Globe and Mail from Bob Fife and, and Steve Chase. And whenever Bob Fife and Steve Chase have a story, I always read that too. The dynamic duo of the Globe. And it's about field hospitals, all about field hospitals and, you know, big contracts awarded to, oh, looky here, SNC Lavalin for field hospitals, field hospitals that have, have never been used. And it was Blacklocks that was first onto that story about a $150 million contract to SNC Lavalin for field hospitals. And Blacklocks was onto that story like months and months and months and months ago. The story about cell phone data and the Public Health Agency of Canada accessing cell phone data for 33 million cell phones in Canada, mobility data, tracking cell phones during lockdowns. That was a Black Locks reporter story. And now that's, you know, that's been blown wide open now. And there are calls from opposition politicians for, you know, hearings and an investigation and uh, this morning, this will be of interest to anyone with a homeowner's insurance policy. This morning, Blacklocks is reporting that you could all soon be forced to buy climate change insurance. Climate change insurance. As part of your homeowner's policy, you would be mandated, I guess you could say, um, to have homeowner's insurance. Quote, Blacklocks reported this morning, Canadian homeowners could be forced to buy climate change insurance. So there's a federal report to emergency preparedness minister Bill Blair. Quote, we welcome and support the core findings, Blair said yesterday in a statement. Quote, adequate protection from climate change hazards is increasingly warranted in the face of mounting disaster risks. So we're going to get into some of those stories and a few more with the help of Tom Korski from Blacklocks, Minding Ottawa's Business. Derek Fage will be back. He is the host of Daytime Ottawa on Rogers Television, and he is never short of an opinion on the hottest news stories of the week. Daytime Ottawa returned to Rogers Television this week. Derek was working from home. I want to ask him all about that. What was that like? You know, I've never worked from home. Through all of this, always come into the studio. Alex is in for David this morning, by the way. David is working from home today. And uh, Alex, if you call us during the talkback hour, you'll be speaking with Alex today. What about you, Alex? Have you worked from home during the uh, pandemic? Have you worked from home? Or mostly, uh, you've mostly been here. Right? A little bit. I, I've worked from home, like, here and there. Like, Do you have a preference? Do you like coming to work, or do you prefer to work at home? I do not like working from home. You know, because all. of me, right? You want to see me? Yeah, I, I get my to sunny, see your beautiful face. My, my every sunny morning. disposition. <laughs> but I know people who are working from home and they never, ever, ever want to go back to work again in an office environment, like ever. And I also know people who have been working from home from the very start of all of this and, and they can't wait to get back to the office because um, working from home is just not working for them. So we're getting into that with uh, with Derek, and we might even talk about music. This morning, we usually end up talking about something related to pop culture whenever Derek is on. Also on the show this morning, we were hoping to get the acting fire chief on, um, Chief Hutt from the Ottawa Fire Service, but understandably, he's busy. <laughs> I think we can, uh, we can appreciate that. He's dealing with the, the aftermath of the huge fire yesterday in this industrial area. Uh, Maryville near Slack. So there's an update. There's an update happening this morning, Alex, on that. Is that right? There's going to be a media briefing on what's going on there, or uh, they're going to live stream some information? Or Yeah, the uh, media avail is currently underway, oh, it's in, underway. Uh, we... in Maryville, and we're just trying to figure out some information. Our news team is on it. Okay. Do we have a feed of that, or uh, is there a webcast of that somewhere? Unfortunately or? not. It's only in person. Okay. So All right. Do what you right. can. 
Okay. All right. The, so the city councillor for that area is Keith Eggline, Knoxdale Maryville Ward Councillor. He's going to come on the show this morning, tell us whatever he can about what happened yesterday afternoon, the nature of the investigation. And Councillor Eggline is also chair of the Ottawa Board of Health. So we'll ask him about uh, the plan to reopen the schools on Monday. Although the way the weather forecast is looking, the um, reopening of the schools could coincide with an old-fashioned snow day. (laughs) Given Jill's weather forecast, what do they say? 20 to 30 centimeters for Monday. Yikes. Get all the latest news from up the line for you this morning. Bruce McIntyre is the Rob Snow Show's Ottawa Valley correspondent. He's with the Eganville Leader. He's usually with us in the middle of the week, but uh, had a scheduling conflict this week, so we moved him to Friday morning. And uh, we're good to go with that. Steve Warren, veteran sports broadcaster, host of the Sens Nation podcast and SensNationHockey.com. And my goodness gracious, there was actually a Sens game last night. The Ottawa Senators actually played a hockey game last night in Calgary. And the Senators won the game with Matt Murray in goal. Will wonders never cease? And if it's too cold to do anything outside this weekend, you can be like me and just uh, stay inside and watch football. That's what I plan to do. It's wild card weekend in the National Football League. And we always wrap up the week with the Queen's Park Week in Review, a panel discussion with um, members of the legislature. Our MPPs are raring to go. I think most of the debate will be about the return of in-class learning. Now, in the middle of every Rob Snow show, there's you. It's the talk back hour. It's an hour of opinions. Your opinions. An hour of phone calls. Your phone calls. You call me. I don't call you. Today it's the Friday free-for-all. So just about anything goes. Okay, we've spent all week coming up with topics. So now it's your turn. That's how we roll on Fridays. We can talk about whatever. Whatever it is you want to talk about. You know, my my Snow and 60 commentary this morning was about uh, winter cyclists. But we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. You You can blow the lid off of a major political scandal. You got the dirt. Fill us in. Or you can just blow off steam about a minor pet peeve. Whatever it is, you know, I'm here for you, okay? I'll be your ear to bend. I'll be your shoulder to cry on. We usually end up talking about things that have been in the news, but it doesn't have to be about things that have been in the news. Maybe it's something that you think should be in the news. Whatever it is, 750-1310. That's our call in line, 613-750-1310, right after the 10 o'clock news. And let me tell you, on Fridays, it's always an adventure. Like when I press line one, I don't know what the person on line one is going to say. I press line four, I don't know what that person has to say. Could go anywhere. But you know what? That's how we like to roll into the weekend on the Rob Snow Show on City News. To opening a business in a, especially in a pandemic, in that kind of situation, is very challenging. First, uh, people don't know me, people don't know my product. To build a new clientele, to build a trust, for them to to show them that I care about it. I do love my food. Uh, That was the biggest challenge. And of course, in all lockdown, um, we had to face it regards my employee, guests, ladies, what they work for me. I didn't want to tell them, sorry, I'm close. I'm not having a job for you, no. They have families, they have kids to feed. So this is very important because we are family orientated and uh, we decided to open we of course essential business so uh, been very tough very very tough as we didn't see people on the road market was completely quiet but we knew it that we have to wait and we knew it that we're gonna be fine in this time we build um, online shop uh, Vedel online and uh, we did Uber, Uber Eats, which one is picking up and is very, um, very popular. We have a really good uh, feedback. So this is the um, uh, song for my heart. And uh, yeah, and we try to uh, expand. We are thinking about opening another location. So uh, I want to make Vedel 
famous. I want to make the Vedel place to be for all the families with kids try the traditional food, what their grandparents cooked in the countries when they're from, or even Canadian people. I'm, they're more than welcome to come and try our famous pierogi. I try to be passionate about my food, uh, organic food, food made with love, with all homemade, uh, organic. So. Uh, you can find uh, food from all over the Europe, Polish, German, Ukrainian, Romanian, um, French, uh, Armenian, so all kind of different uh, types of food. Uh, homemade lunches, we focus on the homemade lunches, grandma style. Uh, I keep always saying, like in my Genya Babcha house, how she cooked, I wanted this love and this food over here because I believe that would bring all uh, all people around me and uh, yeah all the um, organic cold cuts uh, lovely selection of, uh, of uh, sausages uh, cheeses European cheeses uh, great selections of mustard uh, French uh, cookies all where you need from Europe you can find here at the Vedel Touch of Europe if you think good way that's it you have to I had the option to cry in the corner and say, oh, pandemic is coming. No, you need to stand up and fight for it and be, have your eyes open, think outside of the box and, and, and do it. Strong Opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Coming up at the 917 Rob Snow Show here on City News. And as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Black Locks Reporter, minding Ottawa's business. I've been a subscriber for a number of years. Encourage my listeners to subscribe to Black Locks Reporter if they want to know what's going on with their federal government. And joining us on this Friday morning is managing editor Tom Korski. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to hear from you. So look, uh, it, it's been a while, Tom, since you've, you've been on the program, and maybe some people aren't familiar with Black Locks Reporter. Tell us a little bit about the team that you have there. It's uh, Electronic Daily, we, we call it. Uh, it's a website. It covers bills and regulations. Well, you know, when people say it's not about the money, <laughs> it's, for us, it's all about the money. Okay. So that's really the, that's, uh, Parliament Hill, everything about the money. Right, and that's what drives your reporting. So, so what does that mean for you say, uh, uh, in, in covering government, in covering politics? What does that yeah. What does that mean for you in the kind of stories that you cover? It, it, it really is. It disqualifies a lot of coverage that people are generally familiar with in in the mainstream. Who's hot? Who's not? Who's sexy? Who's not sexy? This is not the relevant to us because we're really when you're just focusing on the dollars, the waste, incompetence, and misfeasance. You know, who's hot and who's not is not really that interesting. The the incompetence, the waste of money, right? bills and regulations speak for themselves. Yeah, well, you've got a dandy one this morning. Mandate climate insurance on Canadians. Government report says. What does that government <laughs> report say? Am I going to have to buy climate change insurance, uh, Tom? Uh, yeah, it's, it details, details. That's, the, uh, that's where the devil lurks. Isn't that the case, Rob? This is a report, serious report. The feds have looked for years at the problem of insurance payouts and disaster relief. There's 13 million householders in, in this country, Rob. Uh, most people have to have insurance as a condition of mortgage. Everyone knows that. Most people are not living on flood plains and do not have flood insurance, but there's about one-tenth of people who do. And this has been a serious problem. The feds have looked at this since 2019, and sure enough, out comes a quiet report by the Council of Canadian Academies, and it recommends that the feds look at mandating climate change insurance with an opt-out provision. Now, those details, this is billions. This, the implication is billions, Rob. Can't wait to see that bill and that regulation because it's... It, 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 that's when you follow the money, you can't get any bigger money than that. Right, right, right. That's that. That's very interesting. But it seems to, um, according to the report this morning, it's getting um, kind of a, an early thumbs up from the minister, though. Right. Uh, Bill Blair has uh, been enthusiastic, but he's also hasn't done anything about it. You know, they have a serious issue. We've seen, uh, f you know, flood issues in Ottawa. Sure. 
What do governments do? Because the taxpayers can't keep bailing out these people who want riverfront, lakefront, oceanfront property. And it's not fair. Insurers have testified in committee. They've said, look, you can't have just an insurance pool for these people. It would collapse. And why is it fair for the taxpayer or other insurance policy holders to keep bailing them out? It's a big problem. Okay, let's talk about some of the other stories that Black Locks is, was really early on um, broke and, and, and now it, it, it's some of these stories have taken on lives of their own. It was back on um, December 21st that Black Locks first reported uh, a story headlined Feds Admit Cell Surveillance. And this was a, a, rev- a revelation that the Public Health Agency of Canada was, uh, was tracking 33 million cell phones in the country. How did you come across that story? Uh, that was ironically, that was through a contractor's notice. They wanted to continue the program. So they issued a routine contractor's notice to continue this, uh, this data scoop. For up to five years, they wouldn't disclose the cost. Rob, these are the ping, ping, pings on the cell phone towers as you drive along in your car. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to collect all that data they said to monitor compliance with lockdown orders didn't make any sense. Why, why, why would that be useful information? They already know that lockdowns worked. Just, just go down Bank Street. Or you could do what we did. Look at gas tax revenues, which fell 12%. Huh. Fewer people drove because they were out of work, because the shops were closed. Why did they want that Or they were working data? from home, or they were exactly. working, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the MPs on the Ethics Committee just yesterday voted unanimously, said we have to get to the bottom of this. As M- one MP, John Rassard from Barry, put it, uh, was COVID used as cover for this sort of massive government overreach is a pertinent question. Okay, very interesting. So. So that so so you broke that story and now um, there 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 will be hearings on that by the by the sounds of it then Tom is it likely there will be hearings on that then they have voted for that they yeah. want to summon okay. the two health ministers who were responsible for overseeing that program and anyone who's got technical expertise hmm. yeah I mean some people are saying well you know <laughs> what kind of data is this you know it's anonymized data they don't know that you know they they're not tracking Tom Korsky's cell phone or Rob Snow's cell phone but. How do we know that? Right? Well, you know, the, 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 apologists for the program have said, look, if there's nothing here the government would do that Google doesn't do or Facebook, all Facebook wants to do is sell me a pair of tennis shoes. This is the government of Canada. These are the people who, who could collect the taxes and run the prisons. It's completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's serious questions. That information, Rob, when you drive down the street, that's your information. That belongs to you. That doesn't belong to the government of Canada. Okay. Okay. When did Blacklocks first learn of this $150 million contract to SNC Lavalin for field hospitals? How, how long have how, how long has this been? Have you been reporting on this? Oh, that was early innings. Uh, pandemic was March 11, 2020. Within six weeks, the feds had made the phone call to that Quebec engineering company for the field hospitals that no one asked for. To this day, they've never established who was that person in public works who made that call 150 million dollar contract to snc live on because that's another story that's kind of starting to take a take on a life of its own it's finally made it to the front page of um, one of the major dailies with uh fife and chase have a story in uh in the globe this morning um they've never been used <laughs> that's the thing they've never been used so um <laughs> no, right. no province asked for them. <laughs> no province Literally, asked for no them. hospital manager asked for these mobile hospitals. 150 million, and here you are. You have got lockdowns once again. You're led to believe there's a huge overcrowding in in, in these intensive care units. Where 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 is the label and where is the where where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so from a from a from a uh, you know parliamentary machinery point of view, is anything happening on this file? Well, there have been, I know, questions put uh, in the Commons by MPs. Okay. And uh, don't hold your hopes up for the Auditor General's office. But there are members on the, in particular, on the Commons Government Operations Committee who are keenly interested in this. This was a sole source contract, Rob, to a company yeah, that's so- already admitted guilt for fraud and bribery and breach of the Elections Act for illegal campaign contributions. Are, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's move along. Um, gosh, Stephen Gibo, such an interesting, 
guy. <laughs> He's a he really is. He really is. Uh, you know, and you had a lot of, of, of coverage of him in, in his old job as um, Minister of Heritage trying to, to shepherd through, um, what was it, C-10? Was it C-10, the... the the it internet, was. the internet bill, right? The yeah. internet regulation bill, first internet. in history. You know, so so from there, uh, after the shuffle, he moves to his one true love, which is the environment. He's a former um, Greenpeace activist, so this is he's right in his wheelhouse now as minister of the environment. So um, he made some remarks to uh, a website called the Narwhal, which I'm not. Am I saying that right? The narwhal. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. that's correct. I, I'm not familiar with that with that um, online publication, but he he is really pressing the accelerator when it comes to getting everything in line to uh, you know achieve net zero, phase out fossil fuels, all of the all of this stuff. It's minus um, whatever it is outside now, minus sixteen. <laughs> so let's hope those let's hope those windmills are spinning today. But. Um, when he says my timeline is two years, my timeline is two years to begin phasing out fossil fuels. What's he mean? What's he mean there? Do you think? Well, he is referring to the life of the minority government, and, and I guess there was he had some psychic scarring from the last parliament, which didn't last very long. It's not like majority days, so Rob. You know that. And he has this grocery list of of environmental achievements he'd like to see. As you mentioned, uh, this was not gotcha journalism. This was a sit-down interview with an environment advocacy website for, to which Gibo had awarded a quarter-million-dollar federal grant. So they were pretty much holding hands during the course of this interview And when he said, you know, I'd really like to begin phasing out oil and gas within 18 months. Steve gets in. He's a real character. He gets into these crazy scrapes. And then afterwards has to, and it, it's it, it, the implication is that he doesn't grasp the nuances and uses loose terminology. So naturally, they put him in charge. Of <laughs> <laughs> right. right, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it that you point out that this media outlet um, received a grant, a sizable grant, like a quarter of a million dollars from the Department of Heritage when, when he was minister and, you know, took advantage of uh, wage subsidies and, uh, you know, money from various foreign um, environmental organizations. Oh, Tides right? Foundation. Tides oh, Foundation, sure. yeah, Absolutely. Of the European Climate Foundation. So, um, you know, they're true believers in it. So he, he was... You know, he was he 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 was with his his congregates there when he was doing this. But, he was. Uh, you could tell they were relaxed. It was a relaxed, happy moment. It was a conversation, really, and and then it all went horribly awry when the rest of the country said, "What do you what do you what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean two years? Yeah, what do you mean two years? <laughs> like I can't quite afford a Tesla just yet. So, um, I think the the you know for just to end on a lighthearted note, uh, tell me about the solar panel deal. The sol- 1.4 million for solar panels in the Arctic. Where did we yeah, put these the, things? This was uh, federal uh, federal funding for solar panels uh, because the problem is that there are small towns in our country that rely 100% on diesel generators for light and heat. Problem, Rob. Th- th- those are all located in the Arctic. And it turns out, based on the orbit of the Earth around the sun, that these are places that really have virtually no sunlight for entire months of the year. Right. So, <laughs> right. Perfect place for a solar farm. Yeah. Uh, God bless them. Yeah, God bless them. Yeah. Yeah. They keep you busy, don't they? There, 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 do. There's no yeah. end to it, Rob. There, look, there's no end to it. Look, I, uh, I hope this can become a regular routine for us. I really enjoy... Uh, your work, your whole team's work, and uh, having you on to ex- to explain it to us. Thanks again, Tom. Oh, thank you, Rob. Yep. Have a great day. Yep, you too. From Blacklock's reporter, managing editor, Tom Korski. Derek Fage from Rogers Television. Right after the news, this is City News. Oh, my God.
Friday, January 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, feeling in the minus 20s. It's minus 16 degrees and in Smith Falls, minus 14. Here's what's making news this hour. More details released concerning that tragic fire on Merivale where one person has died. One remains in hospital in serious but stable condition. But there are also five people who are right now unaccounted for. Four men and one woman. They are all presumed dead. Ottawa Police Arson Unit is involved in the investigation. Now, more on this tragedy in our city from yesterday afternoon in a fire on Merrillville Road coming up on the Rob Snow Show with the area councillor, Keith Egli. That is coming up shortly. The chief public health officer in the country, Dr. Theresa Tam, will hold a briefing this morning providing an update on COVID-19, including some new data and modelling numbers for this virus. This comes as hospitalizations hit a fresh record high in Ontario yesterday. As of tomorrow, truck drivers crossing into Canada from the U.S. will need to be fully vaccinated, despite an earlier statement that Canadian truckers would be exempt. And the winner of the Snowsuit Fund 50-50 draw is Jacob Adams of Cars. The young man says he plans on sharing some of that with a person at work who suggested he buy the tickets in the first place. Jacob takes home a prize of 409423 bucks. The other half goes as to the snowsuit fund to help clothe Ottawa children in warm winter weather wear. City News Time, 9.33. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Derek Page is uh, back. Derek Page is uh, back with us. Derek Page is back with us. Rogers Television. Sorry about that, Derek. Um, we're, ju- we're just getting this breaking news now as this... Um, news out of the fire yesterday is uh, has taken a terrible turn here with uh, Keith Egli mentioning by way of his social media accounts we we now have learned of one casualty as a result of the Maryvale fire as well as a number of accounted unaccounted for employees who were on site quote my thoughts and prayers are with all the family members fellow employees friends as they strive to process this horrible event so um that is not the sort of information that we had um this time yesterday when we were learning that there were some people in the hospital uh uh too critically injured but now it, this is um this is quite something else this is uh, yeah this is um uh, become kind of a next level event so yeah my thoughts uh, with the families as well rob that's horrible news yeah yeah so uh councillor eggly as i mentioned is uh scheduled to join us at a about um, 9.45, 9.50, it all depends on uh, on the timing of this briefing uh, from the Ottawa Fire and the Ottawa Police Service that is happening right now. So, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Good, good. Yeah. Good week? 
Yeah, well, you know, it's it's had its uh, it's had its ups and downs. So we're we're back on the air, as you know, as of uh, Monday. I'm I'm actually hosting it from home. Uh, so we had some technical issues on on the Monday. Uh, you know, it, it's tricky when you're doing virtual television, right? Because yeah. you have to rely on everybody's uh, connection and then you know internet connection being reliable. And um, you know, so, some some of the people that we speak to are are living in more remote areas, so it right. makes it more certainly more difficult. Yeah, uh, the digital to... divide to contend with, right? Exactly, so, yeah. exactly. So mo- yeah. Monday was a bit rough, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> for okay, those listeners okay. that watch daytime, uh, apologies for Monday's <laughs> show. Uh, a few technical glitches there. Oh, it's going to happen. Um, it's gonna but happen. Is it impro- yeah. it's improved every day, so I think we've okay. moved, smoothed out uh, all the wrinkles. I mean, for me, yeah, it's nice. I'm, I'm kind of a guy that, that likes to go in. I, I like the vibe of being in the studio, even when yeah, we're yeah. doing it virtually. It just has a different feel to it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But I also love waking up and being able to sit in my pajama bottoms and throw on a dress shirt <laughs> I bet you and do, jacket yeah. and, uh, yeah. and yeah. feel comfortable, right, sitting in my, my home office here. So, yeah, pros and cons, but uh, it's been great. And I'm certainly grateful to Rogers that uh, we could keep this going while they, uh, you know, follow precautionary measures of sure. their own. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. There's something about coming into, uh, I don't know, for a radio guy like me, just coming in, you know, sitting down getting set up, getting comfortable, messing around with the microphone. It's got to be a certain direction and everything else, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know if well, you get. I, like I don't know if you get that from working from too. home. So yeah. Yeah, and I like talking to colleagues sure. as well, right? Yeah. So, you know, I've worked in your environment where it's it's nice when you know the, the you've got the newsroom there and every you know people are working away and you, you get to bounce ideas off of people and people are coming up with different ideas and you get to share information. I love that part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the biggest news story of the week, Derek, was the anti-vax tax, the Mm vaxi tax uh, out of the province of Quebec. Now, some people are already thinking that, well, this might just be a ploy from Premier Legault. He has no intention of following through. Um, He says he may. He says he plans on doing it. But what do you expect him to say if he's asked? Are you really going to do it? No, I'm just faking it. But (laughs) but. what do you think about the very idea of it? taxing the unvaccinated? What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I would take him seriously. I mean, uh, Legault likes to be the first at doing everything. We've seen that through the entire pandemic. We want to be the first to lock down. We want to be the first to open up. We want to be the first to do a, a tax now. You know, I, for, for things like this, I'm, I'm usually a bit of a wait and see guy because I like to see, you know, sort of what reactions are. We've seen some reaction, but let's be honest, early numbers suggest it may be working already, right? As officials intended, you're seeing thousands that, re- you know, that registered to receive their first dose after the tax proposal was revealed. And this is similar, Rob, to the spike that they saw with first dose appointments last week after they announced a, a vaccine passport would be required to enter a liquor and cannabis stores. Right. So, yes. Uh, you saw daily first dose appointments, which were averaging, I think, around 1,500, and they've spiked up to, you know, 6,000. So, It's a risky move politically, for sure, but it's working as intended. And quite frankly, if something starts working as intended... But but does that mean the, the, you know, do the ends justify the means, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, that's certainly... I mean, who are they targeting? They're probably targeting about 10% of the the population, right? Um, You you know, and and the timing is interesting, too, because, you know, you, you had Aruda, the public health director... Uh, resigning, he said he was willing to stay on, and Legault said, "No, no, I, I will accept." I accept. No, I accept. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for you know saying that you would stay on, but I I accept. Um, so you know, I think he's kind of the sacrificial lamb there. But the timing of it interesting because the next day, all of a sudden, this proposal is made. I have a feeling that Aruda probably said, "You know, this is nuts. You you, you can't you can't suggest an anti-vax tax and and create more of a divide between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated." Um, I think I think it could work, Rob. I really do. Uh, is it? Are you going to come up with some legal battles? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. There, there's yeah. there's no doubt in my mind about yeah. that. Yeah. But you know, so many people are making sacrifices. Oh. There's so you know lockdowns and sure, so forth sure. going on, and, and people yeah. are trying to point out, well, vaccinated people are getting sick. Yes, but they're. They're, they're not dying and they're not ending up in, in the ICU. And the reason why more people 
um, that are vaccinated are getting sick is because more of us are vaccinated. I mean, just do the math, right? I That's know, argument, but right? but what about the slippery slope? Okay, but what about the slippery slope? Okay, you know, obviously people have already made, um, I don't think it's the best comparison, smoking and drinking, right? Because there are sin taxes in place. Well, Um, and they're not contagious. Right. Right? I mean, yeah, but but the issue is, uh, but the issue is, are they a burden? Are the word that has been used, it was used by Legault, it was used by Duclos uh, a week ago today when he was talking about mandatory vaccination forever, that you are putting a burden on society but um, you're not spreading it mm. to the to the lengths of a, a, a pandemic virus rob i mean that is the big difference. right but uh, but I mean, but but, 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 the, but, but the burden that you're putting on the health care system could that be prevented um you know the, the 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 lifelong heavy drinker who ends up with cirrhosis of the liver um you know should we give that person a special tax or a person who uh had a poor diet for years was overweight generally didn't take care of themselves and now they have type 2 diabetes uh which is a, puts an enormous cost on the on the health care system to treat them but those, you know those, so I mean, so you know so is this just is, is you know is this just the beginning where does it end uh with this kind of stuff well yeah but that's you know, i mean we can all say that about everything and, and people point that out all the time well you know the, the, this is the beginning and you know what more mm. what what further rights are they going to take away from us I, I think we just exaggerate on that Let, let's just look at things on an individual basis and those things you just described are certainly slow burns and they do put a, a tax on on the healthcare system i don't have any argument with that however this is a pandemic. It is completely different than all of those things. We we have to follow. We have to follow rules for for a number of things in life. You know, uh, we get speeding tickets if if we you know go over the speed limit. I, you know, there are. I guess they're looking at this as a way to encourage people to follow the rules that they've put in place, okay. rightly right. or wrongly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, politically, it could be a disaster for them. Who knows? But again, Oops. if you've got 90 percent of the people in, you know, in your province that are at least have one dose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this, is po- this is populism in action here. Right. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. We're seeing it in France. Yeah. They're, so, trying, they're, they're talking the same thing. OK. How confident are you about the, the classrooms of the province reopening on Monday? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I, I think they could have come up with a happy medium, to be honest, Rob. I don't, okay. I don't see necessarily why high school students who can look after themselves. I, I mean, you know, on an individual basis, yes, there's probably some issues uh, that parents don't want to leave some, you know, their, their teenager at home alone. I, I understand that. But um, I, I think I would have approached it of, op- you know, opening up elementary school, sending those, you know, younger children back, because what, what, what is some low income family going to do? I mean, they have to get to work. Uh, they, they can't afford to, to, to take time off so that their child can can do online learning. So I, I think they should have sent elementary students back. I think they should have held back high school students. Uh, for online learning for another couple of weeks and then just, you know, sort of follow the numbers. Uh, and, you know, just some, inter- you know, the 30% threshold uh, that they've put in place, it seems strange to yeah, me. Yeah, that is kind of strange, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, we're not going to report anything. You're not going to know anything. They say that parents will only be notified of an outbreak when approximately 30% of staff is just, right. Like, why not just let parents know and then they can they can make up their own minds? on how comfortable they are in that situation. It is, it, I, I, I had a conversation yesterday with a, a man by the name of Tom D'Amico. He's the director of education for the Ottawa Catholic School Board. And I asked him about um, the upgrades to HVAC in the Catholic Board. Asked him how many, they have 83 schools in the Ottawa right. Catholic School Board. I said, how many of them, well, I, I, this is actually, let's play a little bit of the, the yeah, 83 schools, how many have had upgraded um, HVAC systems? Of the physical schools, how many have received upgrades to their HVAC systems, filtration systems, these sorts of things? This is a major source of anxiety for parents, of course, is uh, filtration. Yeah, it, it certainly is. I'm, I'm glad you've asked that question. Rob? Are you there? Uh, 100% is the answer to your question. 100%. 100%. Sorry, we were playing a clip there, Derek. Oh, okay, okay. I I couldn't hear the clip. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
83 100%. schools, 100% of the schools have had new HVAC systems installed. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. At the, at the Catholic board. I don't know what yeah. the situa- what situation is with the public board, but... Uh, well, and that's what the and that's what the provincial government said, right? That they have made all those improvements, that they have more HEPA filters uh, coming. So, um, you know, they're they're bringing in the uh, the rapid testing. I think they're distributing almost four million of them to school, which they said they'd start doing on Monday. Which, you know, we saw what happened. You know, when they were distributing them through the LCBOs. If, if you name the date, like, why didn't they distribute those last week? to all of the schools instead of waiting until Monday to distribute them because you know you know people are going to f- lose their minds and say well they're not available well it's because they decided to ship them on Monday again it, it's just some, some poor planning in different situations here yeah all right Derek I'm going to let you go because we have councillor Eggly standing by and he's going to okay. give us the very latest from um, from the fire scene of Maryvale so look yeah. thank you for your time all the best next week with uh, daytime Ottawa Okay. Thanks very much, yep. Rob. Bye-bye. Talk to yeah, you Derek Bye-bye. Fage is the host of Daytime Auto on Rogers Television. And uh, when we come back on the Rob Snow Show, the very latest on uh, the deadly Maryvale fire with uh, Councillor Keith Eggly from Knoxdale Maryvale Ward. Rob Snow Show on City News. Show returns on Rogers TV and City News 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Keith Eggly is the city councillor for Knoxdale Maryville Ward. Good morning, councillor. Hey, good morning, Rob. What is the latest information that you have uh, about the fire yesterday in terms of casualties? 
Yeah, so sadly, uh, we, it was reported yesterday that uh, three people were taken to the hospital, and uh, sadly, one of those people has since passed away. Um, we uh, still have uh, five uh, employees that were on site, uh, or believed to be on site at the time of the uh, of the fire uh, and explosion, and they're as of yet still unaccounted for. Unaccounted for. And are they presumed to have perished in this fire, uh, Councillor? Well, the 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 police. Um, gave a gave a live statement just about a half an hour ago rob and um as part of that they uh, i'll just quote it says it's not believed that survivors will be found terrible it, it's awful it's just uh it's it's unbelievable have you been to the the scene I have not been to the scene. Um, yesterday, of course, we're trying to keep people away from the scene. They were traffic was closed off, and uh, firefighters and paramedics were engaged. Um, and uh, so, I thought it best to let them do what they do best and do their job. I was at the reunification um, hub last night that was set up at the Woodville Pentecostal Church. Um, I want to thank the church for, for letting the city use their facilities last night and, and into today. Um, so I, I was there and uh, staff were there and, and were there to uh, help family and friends of, of, of employees impacted by the, uh, by the fire. What is your understanding about the nature of the investigation at this point? Well, uh, it's, you know, firefighters are still on, on scene, as you can well imagine, with something like this. There's, there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of cleanup to do and make sure there, there are no hot spots. And as I, I say, there are, there are still some, some employees that are unaccounted for. Um, my understanding is that investigation is underway uh, with uh, a number of agencies, uh, including the uh, Ministry of Labor, the uh, the Ontario Coroner's Office, the Fire Marshal, and uh, the police, uh, the police arson squad. Okay, what do you want to know? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I think we all want to know, you know, the 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 fate of the of the missing five, um, so that their friends and their family can be given some some form of closure anyway um i think that's what we all wish for first uh secondly uh we need to find out what happened here so something something this horrendous can't happen again and if if you know if if uh precautions or or measures have to be put in place to protect against this sort of thing happening again then uh, we need to know what those things are and to put them in place as soon as possible okay the business has been identified in the news media as Eastway Tank Pump and Meter Limited. Ever hear, ever hear of it before? Well, I knew I knew it was there. Okay. Um, in in certainly in my time as counselor, it's it's not been a business that I've engaged with. It's not been a business that's caused any concern, any complaints, had any requests. Um, so I probably know as much about the business as you do from from looking online. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what but else. Not, not any kind of reputation as being you know a problematic business or an unsafe not at all. business. Not at all. Complaints from neighbors or anything like that that you ever came across as a not city counselor. All. Not at all. And I'm sure I'm sure the, the the business is just is devastated and and uh, you know is is dealing with with their employees that are injured or passed or missing. Um, so no, we've we, I've, I've never had any complaints, any concerns raised to me about this business. Okay, all right. For people who are unfamiliar with the area, tell us about this area. Well, I mean, it's where it happened. There, there are a couple of uh, communities that are that are reasonably close to it. it it's it's industrial, but there there are uh, Pine Glen community, uh, Country Place community are, are quite close by, um, and. Um, you know, uh, certainly I heard from the community associations and, and residents in both those areas with questions uh, around things like uh, air quality and, and there was a, a concern about whether or not um, their their water would be impacted because uh, uh, Pine Glen is, is, a, is on well water and septic. 
So uh, wow. they they uh, raise concerns about uh, about what runoff I guess might come from the uh, from the fire site. So I've I've made some inquiries in that regard, and and at this point the fire service is saying that the hazmat team was there, um, and that mitigation measures were taken, so as to uh, has to deal with the, with those kinds of issues occurring. Okay. Anything else? Uh, any other information? Anything I didn't ask you that you would like to pass along, Councillor Egli? Uh, this is very much a developing story. I think it's caught a lot of us off guard uh, um, that it yeah, has no, turned. Uh, the story has turned so tragic the way it has in the, in the last few. Yeah, hours. no, absolutely. And and I guess you know the only other things that I would like to say very quickly is is you know uh, a huge thank you to our firefighters, our paramedics, our our police that uh, have been out there since yesterday afternoon and continue to be on site uh, in very cold temperatures, you know, doing, doing what they do best. Um, and, um, and also the uh, reunification site is still open uh, at Woodville Pentecostal uh, Church. So any family members, friends, fellow employees that uh, need some help, need some support, um, that's where they can go. And, and there are people there to, uh, to help them. All right, Councillor Eglai. Do um, you, you think the city's ready uh, for the return of school on Monday? As the chair of the Board of Health, you think we're ready to go for in-class learning on Monday? Well, there's a pivot. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge for sure. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, Dr. Etches has uh, taken the position that schools should be the last thing to close and the first to open. Um, she she wanted the schools to open, um, you know, sooner rather than later. Yep. Um, masks are being shipped to the schools. HEPA filters are being shipped to the schools. I don't know the full status of, of what's arrived and what hasn't arrived. We've had another week or so for people, more people to get vaccinated. Um, so, uh, you know, the, and I'm hearing from lots of parents, lots of families that want their kids back in school. Equally, there's a lot who are, are concerned and uh, about it. So it will be it'll be a little bit bumpy, I think, Rob. Um, we all have to work together on this, stick together on this. But um, you know, uh, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, you know, based on discussions with Dr. Edges and the and the OPH team, that. Um, that we're making or not us, but the province is making the right decision in this. And, um, you know, that the kids will be back to school in a, in a more conducive environment for them yeah. socially, learning wise and every other Absolutely. way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, counselor, it's, uh, it's been a difficult morning. I really thank you for taking the time for us and, and sharing what information you have on this terrible event and, uh, and telling us a little bit about the expectations for Monday. Thanks again. No problem at okay, all. Rob. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, counselor Eglai. Keith Agli, Knoxdale, Maryville Ward, Councillor and the Chair of the Board of Health. Uh, again, we'll have the very latest developments and all the, uh, the new information that we have on uh, the terrible and now we're learning fatal fire at 1995 Maryville Road yesterday afternoon. Coming up in our 10 o'clock newscast. Rob Snow Show, City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, January 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, feeling in the minus 20s in this wind in Ottawa, minus 16, minus 14 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. All breaking news from Ottawa police. One person died. Five more, though, are presumed dead after yesterday's fire at a fuel storage facility on Merivale Road. With the latest, here is City News reporter Chris Curries. The explosion and fire at Eastway Tank sent three to hospital. One man has been released. Another remains in serious but stable condition, while the third succumbed to his injuries this morning. Officials now searching the wreckage of the heavily damaged building for five employees who are unaccounted for, which include four men and a woman. Police not expecting to find any survivors. The arson unit is the lead. It's not known if arson is suspected. The Ministry of Labour, the Ontario Fire Marshal, also part of the investigation into the incident that took place yesterday around 1.30 in the afternoon. Condolences and heartache from councillors, elected officials and the mayor pouring in. Jim Watson tweeting his sincere thanks to all the first responders and asks everyone to pray for the families of the employees who remain unaccounted. Chris Curry's City News. City News Time 10.02 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Colder air is moving in. We've already reached our high for the day for the afternoon. We'll set it about minus 19. Lots of sunshine today. A gusty north wind tonight. Clear, cold, risk of frostbite. A low minus 26 will feel like minus 35. Sunshine for Saturday and Sunday but heads up for snow Monday. For today, falling temperatures for the afternoon minus 19. And right now feeling in the minus 20s, it's minus 16 in Ottawa minus 14 in Smith Falls. Some Ontarians can book appointments for a fourth shot of COVID vaccine starting this morning. Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Kieran Moore, says appointments for moderately to severely immunocompromised people available through the Provincial Vaccine Contact Centre. Now, that started at 8 this morning. Moore says the move aims to provide further protection for vulnerable populations. Now, the province has already started administering fourth doses in long-term care homes, retirement homes and other congregate settings. Federal government plans to update today. The chief public health officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, is having a briefing this morning. That will update COVID-19, including some new data, as well as modeling numbers for the virus. Hospitalizations have hit a fresh record high yesterday in Ontario. And as of tomorrow, truck drivers crossing into Canada from the U.S., have to be fully vaccinated or they will not be allowed in. Some Ontarians are waiting so long for a COVID-19 PCR test. Results almost don't matter anymore. There's a huge backlog in labs. Here's City News reporter Carl Hansky. Those who qualify for a free PCR test say it's not an easy process these days. It was just backlogged. I had to wait four days, four or five days. And then and you then, got the test. And then how long do you have to wait for the results? A week. It's because labs are swamped. Yesterday, there was a backlog of 80,000 PCR tests in the province, down from 98,000 earlier this week. It means some people are waiting weeks to get their test results. It's useless. You're already over the COVID at that point. Now, compounding the problem, many labs are short-staffed at a time when the number of tests is rapidly rising due to Omicron. Ontario Health has been on a hiring blitz to try and get more lab workers. Carl Hansky, City News. City News time, 10.04. The winner of the Snowsuit Fund 50-50 draw from this morning, Jacob Adams of Cars. The young man says he plans on sharing some of the winnings with a co-worker who suggested he buy tickets to this lottery. Jacob takes home a prize of 409423 bucks. The other half goes to the Snowsuit Fund. They make sure that all Ottawa's children have warm clothing for the winter. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. And it's a Friday free-for-all. So we don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics and, and we just kind of roll with it. We usually end up talking about things that are in the news or that have been in the news this week. Not a hard and fast rule. Doesn't have to be in the news. Maybe it's something you think should be in the news. Whatever it happens to be, we're usually good to go with it. 
750 I, I Just bear with me, uh, and we'll start the calls. I, I just want to read word for word um, the very latest from the Ottawa Police Service on what happened yesterday at Maryville and Slack. Quote, Multiple agencies, including the Ottawa Police Service, the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office, the Ministry of Labor, Ottawa Fire, and the Regional Coroner's Office, continue the investigation and search after yesterday's explosion and fire at a commercial business located at 1995 Maryvale Road. Police and emergency crews have been working to locate all people who may have been at the site when the explosion occurred. Unfortunately, one of the three men transported to hospital yesterday has succumbed to his injuries this morning. One man remains in hospital in serious but stable condition. The third was released from hospital. Five people continue to be unaccounted for and are missing. It is believed these individuals, four men and one woman, were at the building when the explosion occurred. Their identities will not be released at this time. The families and loved ones of those individuals have been notified and are being supported by victim supports and investigators. Recovery and investigative efforts are underway at the site. The site is heavily damaged, and these efforts and investigations will take time. It is not believed that any survivors will be found. The Office of the Fire Marshal has sent numerous investigators and will be the lead to determine the origin and cause of the explosion and fire. The Ottawa Police Arson Unit will act as agents for the coroner and will be the lead investigative unit for the Ottawa Police Service. The Ministry of Labor will conduct a parallel investigation. Ottawa Fire Service will provide scene safety and logistical support. Scene safety and logistical support. But that is a, 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 a terrible news on this Friday morning. It is not believed any survivors will be found. That's the uh, that's the very latest to come out of the uh, the update from the Ottawa Police Service this morning. Um, but thank you to our first response. I want I do want to echo what Councillor Eggly said. This is not the news anybody wanted to hear, but um, but our first responders, our firefighters. It was an intense effort yesterday to deal with that with that fire. I was listening on uh, on the scanner yesterday, and it was dangerous. It was a dangerous, dangerous fire, and we're still all over it here at City News. The, our firefighters, God bless them, they go to just about every emergency call. We call them firefighters, but uh, you think of all the emergencies they attend to, um, they do so much more than that. They do so much more than that, and you think about... Um, you think about dealing with fires in, in this time of year um, and, and investigating a fire when it's you know, minus 20 outside. It only makes the work all the more dangerous. So uh, with that being said, our next news update is at 1030 here on City News. This is, um, this is our talkback hour, so let's get right to our phone calls. Mike in Ottawa, thank you for calling Mike. You're on City News. Hi, Rob. Hi, uh, first of all, my condolences to the family. It's very sad what happened yesterday with the explosion. Um, I'm just calling, I guess, just about, uh, just a question to you, actually, about, like, the recent uh, revelations about the uh, people in the hospital with COVID or for COVID. Yeah. I guess it was 46 percent that was identified that were incidental cases. And I'm just wondering, like, doesn't that, um, like, I I know for me, it it kind of makes me question, like, the... The actual death numbers in Ontario, like, are these are these accurate death numbers, or or are these yeah. uh, overinflated? I just want to know. And if it is overinflated, then to what level? And is there any way we can? Well, find I mean, out? you're asking me, but I don't know the answer to that question, sir. Yeah, I have but, no but idea. Like, but but like, you know, all along, uh, you know, people have raised this question from the earliest days of the of the pandemic, when uh, a death is recorded as a COVID-19 death, did the person die with COVID or because of COVID? Yeah, and I guess, like, just a follow-up to that, like, if this is the case, like, you know, does this level of, of, um, does vaccine passports, mandates, and restrictions, does it justify this level of response if it is? Mm -hmm. Yep, all legitimate questions, sir. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, Mike. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you, Yep, bye-bye. 
Uh, Jay in Ottawa, in uh, sorry, in Kinburn. Jay, good morning. You're on City News. Hey, morning, Rob. Morning, Jay. Uh, me. Uh, so I just want to thank you for letting me vent today. My biggest frustration with what's going on uh, with our healthcare system is I've had several family members actually die um, from cancer uh, that they've been fighting for several years. And the frustrating part is is they had an und- undignified death because they were pushed off. Their treatment was delayed because the, can- the beds that they should have been in were full of people who are unvaccinated and who are clogging up our system. So rather than taxing unvaccinated people, I think the solution should be first, priority goes to people fighting for their lives with things other than COVID. Okay. And I may sound like a jerk for saying this, but hey, if you're unvaccinated and you've got COVID, you haven't taken the measures to protect yourself. Why should someone who's actually been fighting and going through all all they need to right. to defeat the disease that they're fighting, why, why should they have priority? Like, it, it just blows my mind. N- not to mention that, you know, the government is blaming COVID for a failed health system. This has been failing for years and should have been addressed when I had the opportunity. But uh, thanks for letting me vent this morning. No problem, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for unloading. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're not the only one who shares that point of view at this uh, point in time. Roger in uh, Drummond. Good morning, Roger. You're on City News. Uh, good morning, Rob. Morning, Roger. Uh, first of all, my uh, my heart goes out to uh, all the families of uh, who lost uh, people in that. Uh, terrible. Yeah, terrible. Terrible, terrible, yeah. terrible explosion. Yeah. And, and and my thanks to the all the sub, uh the first responders first responders uh, yeah. uh, I mean the, the, you, you can't say enough of good about them you know they put their life on the line all the time uh, but there's a couple of issues I want to talk about Robin they kind of tie into each other okay you know like in, in this country you know we, we are blessed with uh, with so many natural resources and energy is one of them yes now uh, uh, but when it comes to like housing and, and affordability, there's a, a lot of issues. One of them is, uh, can you afford to heat your place? Yes. You know, yes. like in our situation, uh, we're using propane. Yeah. You know, and, and propane is very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Like our place, uh, Rob, uh, I redid the place in, from 2013 to 2014, the extensive work. Yeah. And, and we, I can't be any more energy efficient. But okay. I have no control in the cost of energy. Right. And I think the government plays a bit of a role in this too, Rob. When uh, Roger, can I just interrupt you? I, ju- I just want to ask you a question. Um, say the, the, the typical propane tank that you would see outside, say, a rural homeowner's house. Yes. Like the big white round tank. Like we have. I'm, I'm, I don't know what the, the size of that is. Uh, well, I'll tell you. Rob, how much would it cost to fill something like that? Well, we just got a, a fill up the other day. Now, we have three tanks, one for the garage, because I have a, a shop in there, and it's a place I hang out in when I when right. time to myself. Okay. And our house. Our house is uh, on the two levels, excluding the basement, is 1,450 square feet. And, right. And that's, like I say, you can't get any more energy efficient. Well, we were filled up in uh, about uh, the 20th of November. And it cost us seven hundred and twenty dollars for wow. propane for the three tanks. They were all about thirty percent capacity at the time, and they fill them up to eighty percent. Okay. So, uh, out of that bill, about twenty percent of it is carbon tax and HST. Now we just got filled up this past Monday, and they were down to around twenty-five percent each tank, the three of them. Yeah. And it cost us uh, eight hundred and fifty dollars and fifty cents to fill them up. Wow. Now, the price of propane from April of 2021, when we got our last fill-up last spring, was $68.9 cents a liter. Well, yeah. now... What is it now? 83.9 cents a liter. Wow, wow. And, of course, with the cost, as, as each liter goes up, the cost of the carbon tax goes up and the sure. cost of the HSD sure. drop. Yeah, yeah. Now, getting to another point about housing, okay? Yeah, yeah. Now... We bring about 400,000 immigrants here a year, and we need them. You know, this Absolutely. country has to stay a, a, a great country like it is, and we need immigrants. Yeah. And they need a place to live. Yeah. Now, we had some friends of ours who went to see about getting a house builder in January of 2021, and it was $300 a square foot for a house. And they wanted a 2,200 square foot house. They wanted a granny flat for the mother-in-law. And then they decided they couldn't afford that. So they went back about a a month ago to the same contractor 
and to build a 1,500-square-foot house, and it was going to cost them $740,000. And that's on their own land. Wow. So On their own land? On their own land. Wow. So, Rob, how can we bring all these immigrants in here, and we need them? Yes. Where are they going to live in? Tents for the next gonna, 10 sure, years? Sure, sure. Yep, yep. Scotiabank has a new report uh, out, and it says, I believe it says Ontario shy, it's short about 600,000 housing units. And I believe that, Rob, but, but yeah. just, just, just to end this, this uh, conversation, yeah. um, everybody has a role in this. Uh, contractors, uh, the, the people who make the materials, the government has a very big role because you, you've talked about it before, and when, when we have the same situation here, maybe in a little, little smaller scale, about how much money the government takes in development. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. everything. So what... And, and we know that the government can't subsidize every person that needs to live in a home, and everybody deserves to live in a home. So I think it's time that the government and, and all, the, all the industry, everybody has to, to, to take, shake their, their heads and say, look, it, this can't c- continue because you know what's going to happen, Rob? Like the housing bubble in the States there happened years ago. That this is going to explode, and there's not going to be any winners, and there's going to be a lot of people living without it. Yeah. It uh, says, it says uh, I just have it here from, uh, from Bloomberg News. It's a report from the Bank of Nova Scotia uh, from Chief, um, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist Scotia Economics, Francois Perrault. Now, Francois Perrault used to be uh, uh, very big in the Department of Finance and the government, so he knows everything that's going on. And he says that Canada now has uh, adjusted for in- inflation the lowest housing stock of any G7 country right now, and that in Ontario, we're six, we need 650,000 additional units, like right now, right now, to bring the market back and balance. How long is it going to take to build 650,000? Well, it's going to take quite a while, yeah, Rob, because we know that there's, that there's a shortage in, yeah. in, in, okay. in the... Roger, look, it's great to hear from you. Stay warm if you can afford it. But we're trying, Rob. Okay, bye-bye. Thank we'll you. talk soon. Bye-bye. Yep. Uh, Rob Snow Show, Talk Back Hour. Be right back. City News. We just took over this business about a few weeks prior to the pandemic. But we've been loving the community, the people, very friendly. Um, but it's been very difficult starting up a new business. Just the time that we did, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere. We did take a broken business, which doesn't help us, but uh, we thought, we just, we believe in what we do. We're very passionate about food, and we just really wanted to share the Iraqi culture through our food. All our recipes are homemade, so this is very unique. Usually you hear restaurants, shops, it's all frozen food or prepared food, so nothing here is prepared, everything is homemade. We get our meat and produce from a local farm, so supporting local is the way to go. We are supporting all the way. Um, And our meat are actually marinated the day of, so it's as fresh as can be. Quality ingredients and everything is made from scratch. I get a lot of people when they come in, they say it tastes like Middle Eastern, like back home. So for you to have been to Iraq and have the food there, you can really like compare and see the similarity. We do like to focus on healthy. So our recipes, not only the homemade, again, everything is from scratch, but we have like from combos, and to, to like small sandwiches. Our, our, one of our favorites and a lot very popular is the chicken salad and the beef salad. So now you're getting all the protein and all these amazing ingredients that we all need. During this time, I find a lot of people are sitting at home and not enough movement. So to come here and get something healthy, healthy other than go elsewhere and just put, you know, what's not so good for our bodies makes a huge difference. So we have shawarma sandwiches, combos. I mean, if you're looking for a meal to feed your family, I would highly recommend the family platter. It comes literally with everything, with potatoes, um, with rice, with chicken, with beef. Um, 
and we don't charge extra for mix. I know a lot of places do. Here we just add everything to our platter. And lots of healthy choices for sure. We're very passionate about food and for our small family business, it's, it's been good. Like I said, it's a little struggle, um, but we are not a chained restaurant. Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, Rob Snow Show continues. It's a Friday free-for-all. Well, let's keep it going here. Uh, Kim Barhaven, you're on City News. Kim, go ahead. Hi, Rob. How are I, you today? I, I, well, I, I think uh, this news uh, about this fire yesterday is... Um, it's devastating. It's, um, it's, 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 un, it's unexpected and it's terrible news. Well, I hope they find out the root cause of it because it's just uh, unsettling yeah, for sure. Yeah, shouldn't, and, um, and go to, you know, you, uh, you know workplace, yeah. workplace accidents are, it's you shouldn't awful. go to work and die, you know. No, so, yeah. no, my thoughts go out to the family for yeah. sure and, yeah, it's terrible. and support for the first responders that, you know, are, are, are helping they with They have it. to deal with that, yes. So you it, know. it's just awful. Yeah, it's awful. Um, anyway, God bless them all. Um, uh, hopefully they'll get yeah. some. So you want to talk about the surgery backlog? Well, yeah, right. that and um, I also wanted to let you know, you know, years ago, um, I, I, but I guess it was about 43 years ago, I moved in with my, my grandparents to be raised, and my grandmother used to listen to Lowell constantly, and I thought, why are you listening to this? this you know, it's 14, <laughs> right? right? And here I am, stuck to you every morning yeah. now. Just not, on, not, not only listening, you're calling. Right. I know, I know. Right. That's how hardcore you are now. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, no I, you know, I, I used to, you know what, I, where I grew up on Cape Breton Island, they used to have a call-in radio show, and I used to call it all the time, and it drove my father nuts. Why are you calling those radio talk shows? Yeah, it drove right. And here I am hosting yeah. one now. Yeah, yeah no, but you know, um, the, you, you, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before you said about, you know, the, the conservative leader about accommodating the anti-vaxxers. And, yep. you know, and my answer to that would be absolutely not. And Reason, then reasonable on, accommodation. Reason, a reasonable, uh, reasonable. No, 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 not at all. And recently I saw on the news that they are postponing stage four cancer surgeries. And it just alarmed me. I mean, obviously... Stage yeah, knows. there's a re news report that a woman has stage four colon cancer and her surgery's been delayed. It's just wrong. And, and I said to my husband, I said, you know what they should do? You know, all these anti-vaxxers or the unvaccinated that are seeking hospital help with their illness should just be told, well, you know, I think you need to recover at home right now because we have these surgeries that are already booked and are absolutely necessary or these people are going to die. Okay. And send them, you know, the yeah. unvaccinated home to get their vaccinations. I, I just, it infuriates me. And, and, I mean, I heard one woman on the news uh, absolutely, you know, crying and basically saying, you know, my husband, he's somebody too. Yes. Yeah. And he was one that had to have his cancer surgery postponed because no beds because of these unvaccinated hmm. folks filling up the beds. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, it just, I mean, I've lost friends over my stance on this, and that's fine. You know, uh, this is, I, I strongly believe that everybody should be vaccinated to try to get through this thing and get it done. Right. But when I hear about these surgeries, it just, it breaks my heart yep. for the people and nope. their families. All right, Kim. Thank you for calling. Right, cool. Call anytime. Thank you. Bye-bye okay. yep. now. Yep. Paul, Ottawa. Paul, you're on City News. Good morning. Go ahead. Um, so I think it's clear this pandemic um, is dividing us, um, whether it's Legault's, um, you know, decision to possibly tax people in Quebec um, or the fact that you had just two callers during this hour, one talking about how some uh, people he knows uh, died from cancer because they couldn't get the treatment or like the last caller was explaining. And what I find really frustrating is that um, we are considering taxing Canadians and Canadians are suffering, but somehow we're not considering going over the peop after the people who are responsible for this virus. Um, you know, we'll tax Canadians, but I don't hear any talk about going after this, the Chinese Communist Party. And do what? And do what? Should we invade China, Paul? What, what should we do? Well, certainly.
certainly there must be. <laughs> well, no, you, right. you, you bring up a good point, but even if, and you're, you're right about it, but are we truly helpless? Is there not something we can do? You know, like. Well, what do you suggest, Paul? Well, isn't there a way that we can tax Chinese companies that are owned by the CCP? Well, well we could. Um, you know, we could do. We could do. We could, what we could do is we could do something like uh, Magni Magnitsky Act sanctions. We could do something like that. Uh, Absolutely. It, it, you know, if people are complicit in human rights abuses, we can seize their assets. We have the authority to do that under, under yeah, like, Canadian and, law. Like, because the way I see it, you know, it, it's like we're going after the victims here. We don't want you to go after the perpetrators. And another thing that, uh, uh, sort of another cost to this, is that our allies are losing trust in us. You know, I see a lot of um, new alliances being formed between, let's say, Australia and the United States, yeah. Great Britain, yeah. and we're being left out of those things too. Yes, we are. And so he said, "What can we do?" Well, maybe we can change our stance on China and get more aligned with our allies so we, so we don't become not just divided among ourselves, we don't become divided from our allies. And, and my main point is that somehow the CCP has managed to divert accountability on this. You know, this virus in Canada alone has killed 10 times pe more people than died in 9-11. You know, and compromised the health of how many more um, people, damaged our ch children, wrecked habit on our economy. Yet our focus is amongst each other. And to me, like, I'm concerned about that. Our focus should be over on the CCP because here's another reality. It could happen again. Okay. And it could be even more deadly, even more costly. And, and I, I'm just lost as of why, you know, we don't put more of a focus on going after the people who are responsible for this. All right, Paul. Thank, Thank you, you, Paul. Thank you. Yep, yep. Everybody's, um, gosh, everybody's a little on edge today, don't you think, for a Friday morning? Uh, halftime already, Friday free for all talk back hour has a serious tone this morning. This is City News. It's Friday, January 14th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now it is feeling in the minus 20s in this wind. It's minus 17 in Ottawa in Smith Falls. Right now it's minus 15 
Here's what's making news this hour. Six people are presumed dead after an explosion and fire at that fuel storage facility on Merrillville yesterday afternoon. Fire broke out. We knew then two people were taken to hospital. One of those people has since died. The other has serious injuries but in stable condition. We now know five people are missing and presumed dead. They are four men and one woman. Ottawa Police Arson Unit, along with several other agencies, have taken over this investigation. Now, it does not mean there is suspicion about how this fire was set, but whenever there is a death in a fire, the arson unit is brought in. The province says the number of people in hospital uh, ICUs due to COVID has risen today by 27 people, now 527 in Ontario. Also, 42 more deaths attributed to the virus in our province. The number of cases from tests completed is back over 10,000 in Ontario. The breakdown locally, 453 in Ottawa, 146 new cases in eastern Ontario, 54 in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 80 more in Renfrew. We're expecting a federal update as well today. This from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Teresa Tan. She will update modeling numbers and COVID-related data this morning. City News Time, 1031. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. It's time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Second half of the Friday free-for-all. Cindy and Kanata, you're on City News. Cindy, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm more in the line of uh, your last caller before the break. Yeah. But my approach is more the uh, leaders that, um, that uses this occasion to just put gas on the fire. Okay. I'm thinking of Legault. If you remember the Aboriginal uh, patient that was that recorded her death, basically, sure. yeah, yeah. being judged for bad choices and uh, being a burden, this is exact. Premier Legault came out and said, well, this is unacceptable, and he's doing exactly the same thing, putting a... Uh, a responsibility on the patient mm. and even if he doesn't do the tax he has given the the green flag to all these workers to pass judgment on their patient and i think that is very very wrong it's a very slippery slope and when does it become hate speech because to me <laughs> what he said is hate speak if you remove unvaccinated to blacks or Asian being on a burden. Yeah, well, you know, unvaccinated is it is a, is 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 unvaccinated a minority group? It is. <laughs> They're ten percent. Really? Well, I you know do do, do you consider unvaccinated <laughs> people along the same lines as say a visible minority or a religious minority or an ethnic it's minority? Still, it's still attacking a group that don't okay. really have a. No, no a, a, look, I you know I'm, I, I'm not I, I, Cindy, Cindy, I'm not entirely disagreeing with you. I, in fact, I agree with a lot of what you say, but I I don't I don't buy into this. Uh, idea that the unvaccinated are somehow some kind of disadvantaged minority group. I'm not. I'm not. But they are being picked you know. on. They can't work. They can't. They have to pay taxes. There are a lot of places they can't go. Well, you you, you, you could say those are the consequences of their own choices. I know. Those are the but consequences my... of the choices they have made of their own free will, Cindy. I know, but to right? add on that. Um, giving them, putting them a target while they're in I the understand hospital. That. I understand that's that. Wrong. I, I understand that. I don't agree with. I don't agree with the anti-vax tax. I don't agree with it. It's incredibly popular. Um, you know, taxi unvaccinated story of the week, as far as I'm concerned. Premier Legault tightening the screws on the unvaccinated. I must have taken 50, 60 calls on that issue alone this week. There is some speculation. It's just a ploy from Premier Legault that he really has no intention of following through on it. It's just kind of a threat. Now, he maintains he's he's um, he's still going to follow through with it. But, it, you know, if you ask him, are you really going to follow through with this? What would you expect him to say uh, to that question? No, I'm just fooling around with you. I'm just messing with you. He insists that plan is still a go. But at the same time, he said yesterday he's going to lift the curfew in Quebec on Monday. 
which, you know, you think about it's illegal to leave your house in Quebec during certain hours of the day. And for a while there, you weren't even allowed to leave your house to walk your dog. It's hard to figure out that premier sometimes. You know, he, he maintains he wants to stick it to the vaccinated, but he's easing another one of his controversial restrictions, a la couvre-fou, the curfew. I still don't rule out something like a, a curfew for the unvaccinated. Uh, why not just combine the two? And the police pull you over at quarter after 10 at night and say, uh, show me your vaccination papers. But in the end, he's incredibly popular because he's a populist. He's not, um, he's not an ideologue. He's not liberal. He's not conservative. He's, he's a populist. He doesn't care about people who whine about not being able to do things because they're unvaccinated. You can say they're a minority. I, I, he's just going to treat them uh, the same way he treats other minorities, you know, whether they're linguistic minorities or religious minorities, because he's a populist. He appeals. He wants to appeal to the majority, and it's going to serve him well this fall when it's the election. Premier Legault is a next-level politician. I think I said this at the end of the year. I think he's the most potent political force in the country right now. All you have to do is look at the way he gets the, the federal leaders to just bend to his every political whim, no matter how unsavory those whims are. Okay, um, maybe maybe my final rant of the year. No, uh, no of the of the week. No guarantee on that though. Dudley Newborough, you're on City News. Go ahead, Dudley. <laughs> Good morning, Rob. Morning, I'm just Doug. calling you about the health care system. I have an experience with my father. He got sick on a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. Okay. He had All to right. go into port, and he was unable to fly, so they had to take him to a hospital. Okay. In Venice. It's called Mestre Hospital. Look it up online. Uh, slow me down if I'm taking too long here, Rob. But That's okay. anyway, we got to the hospital, yeah. went through the front doors. There was a kiosk in an atrium of trees and flowers and walking paths. 620 feet long and five stories high. Wow. Sounds they checked lovely. him in. He was in his room in 10 minutes. In his Probably room? Probably less wow. than that. Yep. The room was spacious. Two, two people to the room had ward, floor to ceiling windows and a great view. Wow. Okay. Within 15 minutes, they had transferred the, their two, two to a room. They transferred the patient beside him out and brought him one that spoke English. Oh. To kind of oh. accommodate him. <laughs> Accommodating. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There were three restaurants in the hostel. One was a 24-hour snack bar. One was a very good cafeteria. And the other one was a top-notch dining room. Wow. The patient's menu was exactly the same as the top-notch dining room. Hmm. The food was fabulous. Wow. Okay. Every single person staff on that, that's the covering the facilities, I guess. Every person on staff there, from people pushing a cart to the nurses to the doctors, had an iPad. Right. They, and when they walked in the room, they got out their iPad, and whatever they did with it was done in the room. The nurse's station had one chair and one computer. Every other person was in the rooms. Okay. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, and, and where was this again, Dudley? Remind me. A hospital called Mestre. It's just outside of Venice. Just outside of Venice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The okay. care was fantastic. Right. Uh, okay, so look, no, I'm, uh, I'm, look uh, to make a so we don't make yeah. a long story longer here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. How much? Twenty three hundred euros for fourteen days, including the TV. Twenty three hundred euros. Okay. Yep. So for talk two weeks for two weeks for two, two weeks. weeks, including the TV, which was two hundred euros. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, gonna... A purse that was out of out of pocket expense. That was, or was it covered by insurance? No, that was what the insur- That was the bill we insur- We uh, submitted to the insurance company. That was the bill you submitted that to the, the insurance full company. Full bill. Wow! Holy cow! They, yeah. Okay. Because I've been looking this up. I've been at. Okay. Italy spends between eight point one and nine point seven percent of their GDP on healthcare. Mm-hmm. Canada spends point ten point three and eleven point five percent. So we spend more. 
about 40, 35 to 40 percent more. Right. Uh-huh. My brain's taking over probably like yours. Is how the hell does this yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like why doesn't the Winchester Hospital sound like this hospital just outside of Venice, right? <laughs> I, 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 I had to figure it out. And I did ask yeah. the nurses. Yeah. And this is the answer I got, okay? And it's very interesting. Yeah. Ask them how they got paid. I was there 14 days, six hours a day. I got to know them pretty well. All right. A nurse in Italy, registered nurse in Italy at the time, got paid 20,000 euros a year. Wow, okay. Okay? Yeah. 30,000 dollars roughly now they get paid 26,000 a year 26,000 okay. euros or dollars yeah uh, 26,000 dollars a year now or so, sorry euro that's euros yeah euro okay okay yeah. I, I, I think I, well, anyway a Canadian nurse at this time I'm not criticizing anybody to make money is there yeah absolute yeah. right the nurses do a great job gets paid 70 well a nurse in Ontario will make a lot more than that more than double that 9,800 in Canadian Right. Yeah. Double, okay. double or more. Double or more. Yeah. A resident sure. doctor. This is Canadian dollars. Makes just a resident. No, I don't say just a resident, but a resident doctor, right. resident. not a specialist. Yeah. Seventy nine thousand in Canada. Seventy two thousand. Or in Italy, seventy two thousand. Okay. All right. That is not the biggest difference. Their staff is incredibly happy. Okay. All right. So well, look, Dudley. Happy, yeah, happy yeah, Dudley. Right, the phone lines are jammed today, Dudley. But look, very, that. very illuminating. Very uh, interesting, Dudley. Thank you. Look How long ago was this? On. How long ago was this? this that time? was 10 years ago. Oh, 10 years ago. Okay. Well. Yeah, it's probably better now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dudley. Interesting, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Yep. Bye. Uh, I want, really want to take Ron's call. Ron's in bar. Good morning, Ron. Morning. Morning, Rob. Uh, I'm really concerned that Mr. Trudeau will be stopping 26,000 U.S. trucks from coming up from the yeah, U.S. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raised that issue. I'm, uh, uh, I suggest people stock up on stuff. I don't mean hoard. I mean, you may want to take steps for certain items that are coming from the States. This is not a good thing. No, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. That, that's, that's pretty much it, Rob. That's, that's my but thing. What, I, what, really like, what a total clown show, though. Like, I, earlier in the week, the entire logistics industry is pleading with the Trudeau government, like, don't do this and try to convince your American friends not to do it either. Whatever it is you're trying to cure, it's going to be worse than the disease. We have a supply chain. Like, do they not read the newspaper, man? Like, the the supply chain is under immense pressure. What is this going to accomplish, taking 15,000 trucks, Canadian trucks off the road is the estimate, something like that, 15,000 trucks off the road? And not just that, but I, I heard 26,000 uh, coming from the States. Yeah. But it's, so yesterday morning, it sounds, by way of CBSA, like the government had come to its senses, you know, see, you know, okay, yeah, we won't do that. Like, this is supposed to come into effect tomorrow, right? Yep. And th- so they yep. leak, they leak this flip-flop uh, to the major news outlets, and then yesterday afternoon, the clowns that are in charge of this uh, come out and say, no, we don't know where the story came from, and the vaccine mandate for the truckers is is very definitely still on. It's just totally amateur hour. It's amateur hour. You Like, I expect these three Trudeau cabinet ministers, you you know, to jump out of one of those toy cars wearing Shriner hats. Like, what is going on? Like, who are these people? Yeah, I, I look. Uh, we've been living with this for what six years now. This government, I, I, they never make any sense to me. Like, have they not noticed? Do they not worry about? Like, we're talking about basic human needs here. We're talking about toilet paper, and toilet food. paper, food, <laughs> uh, health products, drugs, um, blood, all kinds of things. And uh, did they not notice? Like, inflation in the United States was reported. Uh, this week, seven percent highest since 1982. Think, you know, that's another thing, Rob. I don't know how are we at four and they're at seven. Well, they calculate it different. It, like it's a basket of goods that they measure, and in the United okay. States, a big part of well, I shouldn't say a big part. A part of their basket is used cars, and used car prices are up 40 percent year over year because nobody can get a new car, so they're buying new cars. So the the used cars, so the prices are way up on used cars. And uh, no, I, we, I, we don't even have used cars as, as part of our inflation calculation. It's not even in the yeah. basket of goods. So that's why our inflation report's a little lower than theirs. 
Well, it's kind of wacky here too, Rob. I bought a new Jeep uh, last year, and I was offered more money than I paid for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the prices are very strong for the used cars. I mean, I went in, I I just got rid of my Ram. I, I bought a Jeep, f funny enough, a, a Cherokee, not the Grand Cherokee. That's what but, I sold, my Ram. I sold yeah, my Ram. Yeah, I sold my Jeep. Ram. Um, <laughs> I had no problem selling my Ram. Got a great trade-in price for it. And um, I bought a, uh, the smaller Jeep Cherokee, like not the Grand Cherokee, uh, the yeah. little one. Uh, a lot better on gas. But, uh, you know... It, it wasn't cheap. Like, it was a premium price for that vehicle. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, all right. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, yeah. Day, this man. this trucker decision is, it, I mean, it, it's, it's idiocy. It's idiocy. I don't know what they're thinking. Uh, Derek in Ottawa. Derek, you're on City News. Yeah, Rob, uh, you sort of cut me short there last week. I don't think you intended to. I was just going into the data quickly. Um, I'll start with the part we do agree on. Like, so when you look at the data, you know, there's more people vaccinated in the hospitals than unvaccinated. But as you said, roughly in Ontario, you know, 80% of people are vaccinated and 20% are unvaccinated. So the vaccine does seem to offer some protection with regards to the severity. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the number of cases, 80% of the people... Um, 80% of the people that have COVID are vaccinated. So it doesn't seem to offer any protection as far as getting the virus, if you see what I mean. Yeah, but are so people getting sick and dying if they're vaccinated? If they're fully vaccinated, are they, are they dying? Are they getting no, severely exactly. ill? So we, we agree on that. So it, yeah. it reduces... It reduces the severity. So I'm doing work. It reduces the severity. Um, but the issue is then, if we're treating people that are unvaccinated as, as a risk to others, you get stupid policies like this this new trucker policy where they're going to ban people, which is absolutely ludicrous because they're not uh, increasing the risk to anybody at all. And also, like, I mean, firing a bunch of healthcare workers, now we're short of healthcare workers. So, you know, I think they have to look at the data. I think this is dividing people. Um, but yeah, it does reduce the severity of COVID yeah. for sure. Sure, but it doesn't reduce your chances of getting it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 1047. Uh, we'll be right back. Rob Snow Show City News. Here at the Thirsty Maiden, uh, we offer a variety of products. Uh, so everything from breakfast items, so it's breakfast sandwiches and scones, which have become a staple item here at the cafe. We have an assortment of pastries and cakes and desserts. So we're really big on our dessert bar, which a lot of people come here for. And of course, our delicious coffee beverages. So we do offer uh, not your typical lattes, things like a chocolate banana coconut latte, cinnamon coconut, which is is my favorite and our take on even a pumpkin spice which we add nutmeg and a dash of cayenne in just to give it a bit of a kick when you start a business um, you don't factor in all the things that could go wrong you think anything that goes wrong any failure it's got to be something on your shoulders you didn't market right you're carrying the wrong products you didn't price your items correctly all the things right um, but when this pandemic began things going through my brain were I didn't factor in a pandemic. Um, and we were just starting to grow. We were about to blow up, you know, and I think I spent two days crying. Um, and then I shut my business down for, I think, a period of two or three days. And um, just being at home for those, for, during that time, I realized this is not me. I'm, anybody that knows me knows I'm a, a hard worker. I don't give up and I'm a go-getter. And I started to think, well, I, I should probably just start clearing out my freezers and posting and seeing who wants to buy what. And that was sort of how I built my momentum back up. I realized that there's still a large number of people that wanted to support us and were looking for the items that I had to provide. So we started there, then I reopened literally not even three or four days after I closed my doors and then started doing curbside pickups and deliveries, started doing the deliveries myself, free deliveries to the local community, going as far as Bell's Corners and CARP as well. And uh, that's why we're still here. This community has really kept us going a year into the pandemic. But we've had a changeover of staff a couple times now and uh, you know, situations change and 
you know, when you can't offer hours and staffing, uh, sorry, hours for your employees, you don't blame them when they have to go elsewhere. So I think that's also been one of the challenges is recruiting, training, and then they leave, you know, and then bringing in more people and recruiting and anybody in this industry will, you know, will tell you that that's something we deal with on a regular basis, whether or not COVID's in the mix or not, but um, more so now, because every time there's a lockdown, there's a risk of, Will we make it through? And then you lay off more staff. And again, their situations and their circumstances change. Open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Home stretch of the Talk Back Hour. Albert, Ottawa. Good morning. You're on City News. Albert, go ahead. Good morning, Father Rob. Yep, At the I end am. of the conversation, I hope you don't send me to the town hall for flogging. <laughs> okay. I, All right. um, I uh, was advised in, at the beginning of November by my doctors that I can go on a trip. I just came back from Cuba, wow. and I have an important uh, thing I want to say here. Yeah. Uh, coming through customs, um, about I'm going to say approximately here in Ottawa, 50% of the people have to do an additional COVID test, even though you had 172 hours prior to to arriving in Ottawa. My girlfriend has to wait approximately, she, they told her, uh, up to uh, five days in the home, which is fine. We, we respect that. We have no problems with that. But here's, here's, here's the stickler. I had friends that came back at the, um, at, the, at the beginning of Christmas, and they went on the cruise. They went f from Miami and left Miami. They went to NASA. They um, toured NASA. Uh, they went to Mexico, got off at Mexico, came back um, uh, in Miami again, sat around um, in Florida for approximately three quarters of the day until the flight back uh, to Toronto. And then um, once again, um, not everybody gets tested, but in this couple, one out of the two got tested. Um, uh, sorry, one of the two got picked off for the extra PCR. And here's the clincher. Here's the clincher. They told them because they came back through the USA that they don't have to stay home, that they, they will get results within three to five days, but then it's not a mandatory stay at home because you've come through the USA, which is absolutely ridiculous because the USA right now has the biggest, probably one of the biggest COVID numbers in the whole world. Anyway, I just I wanted to make that point. I wanted to let people know how this government thinks. I think it's ridiculous. All if right. you're going to make a, if you're going to make somebody stay home, it should be all or nobody, because like I say, um, the, the the judgment call for them to use the traveling to the USA um, after a seven day or fourteen day cruise right. uh, as being um, uh, acceptable to go wherever you want until you wait I don't know, until you wait for your results. I think it's crazy. All right. Thanks, okay. Albert. All the best, bud. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm probably not going to take uh, Chez's call. Chez, I love your calls, but you've called twice already this week, and we've got other people who haven't been on at all this week, so uh, it's no offense. You call me next week, I'll take your call. But uh, uh, Marcel in Hawkesbury. Marcel. Yes, hi, Rob. First-time caller. Uh, I appreciate that, life. Marcel. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, very little attention has been paid to that uh, news release from Pfizer on Tuesday that said that uh, their Omicron vaccine will be ready for March. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that what people are getting now is pretty well useless because 80 to 90 percent of the uh, uh, COVID-19 cases are caused by Omicron? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And, you know, what use will it be in March? You know, but, you know, it's, it's on. Uh, it's on the co you know, it's on the cover of newspapers. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Marcel. It's on the cover of newspapers this morning that Omicron might be peaking already. Yeah, right? it is. So. It is, and uh, by March, April, it's going to be a different variant. Yeah, maybe. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's food for thought. But food for uh, thought. If people okay. want to really uh, learn about uh, what's going on with this COVID nineteen. Read uh -huh. Robert Kennedy Jr.'s book. Oh come on, Mark. fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Does it come with free tinfoil? That book. Uh, 
lifelong subscription to um, Alcan. <laughs> <laughs> Don't follow that advice. Don't read anything from Robert Kennedy Jr. Nothing. Uh, Rodney. Good morning, Rodney. Hey, good morning. Yeah, hi, Rodney. Hey, I'm uh, phoning back. The last time we were... We didn't talk. I said I'd be hanging on, so I hung on, and I'm calling you back. All right, Rodney. Hey, okay. and then I wanted to start, well, I guess I'll start off on... It says you're calling from rural Ottawa. Where are you today? Oh, oh same place. Same place. Carlsbad Springs Oh, Carlsbad area. Springs. Okay, all right. You know, okay. I, I could joke around and say I'm your next-door neighbor and ask you for my exact address. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know? No, I thought you were more of an urbanite, though, Rodney. Uh, uh, no, I'm... I'm country. You You're know, just country. I'm okay. looking out the I gotcha. look in the mirror and look oh. across the street and see go. the snow and the trees. Ah, beautiful. Sounds you nice. Know? Sounds nice. But hey then Yeah. Uh part of my thought frame was sort of interrupted in the sense of, you know, my thoughts are gonna be with the families Absolutely and, right. and the friends. Yeah. The first responders that had to deal with everything yesterday. Yeah. And the people that are still dealing with on site and have to you know, deal with the family and friends, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, it's well said, Rodney. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. it's got to be more than just the family because there's you no know, big changes, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then I, I'm sort of going to go in reverse order on my pleasant thought frame this morning, and i got to start off with just wishing you a happy birthday for your show. Oh, yeah, two which years was, ago yesterday was my was first yesterday, show. Yesterday, yeah. and then it sounds like a whole bunch for a parent, you know, two going on 22. <laughs> 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 All right, Rodney, yeah. I'm going to jump, buddy. We're going to take one more call, and that'll be that. He's in the Pontiac, Keith in Shawville. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, best wishes to those people, the lost ones in that explosion. The one other thing I wanted to mention was um, Trudeau, so two-faced, he gives an interview on Global TV uh, uh, New Year, on Christmas Day talking about how the nations have to stick together in uh, dealing with China. Yet he hasn't banned that Huawei. Huawei. Te yeah. Huawei uh, telecommunication. Huawei was, TELUS was advertising that they were going to bring te uh, Huawei, Huawei, I can't even pronounce it. Huawei. Huawei on their, um, using that for their internet their uh, 5G5, but everybody, Australia, Britain, the United States had all banded by that time, but yes. so it's it just the inconsistency of him. He's not dealing with the other countries at all in China. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Okay. Got to jump. Yep. Bye-bye. Um, coming up after the 11 o'clock news, I believe we are going up the line and getting uh, the very latest on the Ottawa Valley. Bruce McIntyre will join us, our Valley correspondent here on the Rob Snow Show with the Eganville leader. This is City News.
Coast in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, January 14th. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, minus 17, it feels like minus 27. In Smith Falls, minus 15, it feels like minus 24. Here's what's making news right now. All breaking news from Ottawa police at tragedy in the Pian. Five, make that six people, are presumed dead after a fire yesterday at a fuel storage facility. One person confirmed dead in hospital, but five are presumed dead, uh, missing and uh, presumed dead. One other person remains in hospital with serious injuries, but in stable condition. Another person has been released from hospital. With the details, here's City News reporter Chris Curries. Awful news from Merivale Road. Five employees remain unaccounted for, four men and a woman, and police say they are presumed to have perished in the explosion, which has left Eastway Tank and Pump in a state described as, quote, heavily damaged. It's awful. It's just, uh, it's it's unbelievable. Area Councillor Keith Eglai. Investigation is underway. Uh, uh, with uh, a number of agencies, uh, including the uh, Ministry of Labor, the uh, the Ontario Coroner's Office, the Fire Marshal, and uh, the police, uh, the police arson squad. He's also thanking first responders. A sentiment shared across the board on social media. Ottawa Fire tweeting their shock to the tragic incident and reminding residents the distress line is open 24/7. As is the reunification center at Woodvale Pentecostal Church. Chris Curry's City News. City News Time, 11.02, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Colder air is moving in. We've already reached our high for the day for the afternoon. We'll set it about minus 19. Lots of sunshine today, a gusty north wind. Tonight, clear, cold, risk of frostbite. A low minus 26 will feel like minus 35. Sunshine for Saturday and Sunday, but heads up for snow Monday. For today, falling temperatures for the afternoon, minus 19. And right now, feeling in the minus 20s, it's minus 17 in Ottawa, minus 15 in Smith Falls. The province says the number of people in hospital ICUs due to COVID-19 has risen today by 27. Now 527 in ICU, 42 more deaths also attributed to the virus in Ontario. The number of cases from the tests that have been completed is back over 10,000 across the province. The breakdown locally, 453 in Ottawa, 146 in eastern Ontario, 54 in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 80 more cases in Renfrew. City News Time 1103, federal officials are set to release new pandemic data and COVID-19 modeling uh, that may reveal if the Omicron variant is starting to recede. Hospitalizations did hit another record high in Ontario. The province opened up vaccine booking system to people with compromised immune systems so they can make an appointment for a fourth dose. That opened up at 8 o'clock on the provincial site this morning. Omicron hasn't peaked yet in Manitoba. Doctors there, for example, say they're in the dark about how the province will deal with an ever-increasing patient load. One of Robert Kennedy's children expressing relief. The governor of California denied parole for the man convicted of killing her father in 1968. Governor Gavin Newsom says 77-year-old Sirhan Sirhan still poses an unreasonable public safety threat. Kennedy's daughter, Carrie, says Sirhan needs to remain locked up. He would be a a very, very scary person to release on the streets of uh, California. Now, Kennedy was a U.S. senator and former attorney general. He was a brother of former President John F. Kennedy and longtime Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM.
race is on from the bush to the pond and back where the judges feel you've won their seal for the snowmobile you've won their seal for the snowmobile all right, it's time for Valley View. Bruce McIntyre's back. He's our Valley correspondent for the Rob Snow Show. You can also read uh, some of his material, ottawa.citynews.ca, and he is with the Eganville leader. How are you these days? And he is very warm. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> good, 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 good. Where are you? Well, it depends what you ask me. Three hours ago, I was out at uh, Mattaway Park in Renfrew at the opening of the official skating oval. Uh, okay, and okay. right now I'm on 416 heading back into Renfrew. So I've got it there, here, there, and everywhere. Been okay, attempt coming back okay, already. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just heck of a day to be a heck, a heck of a day to be out and about, Bruce. I know. Well, Rob, it's winter. We embrace it. We love it or we hate it. And I yeah. just grin my teeth and go forward. Yeah. Ice it's fishing must be pretty big up there, I would suspect. It is huge. I, yeah, have the, you, are you seeing the shacks? Have they got the shacks out or what? Yes. Yeah. I went over to a couple of rivers. They out at Golden Lake. They're out on uh, several rivers. And next month is the annual uh, Cobden Fishing Derby where a thousand people usually show up and they get out there and do some fishing until the ice doesn't hold up anymore. Right. But, yeah. any but are they actually going to do that? Are they actually going to have I, that? Or? Who knows? Last year they did a virtual. Yeah. Um, people went out. Virtual ice fishing? fishing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, guy, you see a TV in the aquarium. It sounds on. like a Mario <laughs> Brothers thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This COVID thing. I, I, I know it's terrible. Kind of what's open? So. Well, I mean, um, you know, last week you and thank you for the for the tip. Um, you know, it's sad. They they Renfrew was getting ready for the Ontario Winter Games. Um, you know, thirty five hundred yeah. athletes. Um, I think there was. I think the organizer told us about 6,000 or so spectators expected at some of the events. Yeah. Uh, uh, probably, you know, full hotel rooms and everything else in the area. Uh, great, you know, millions of dollars in economic benefits, and um, they can't go ahead, so. No, unfortunately. they had that, that was always when they um, took the bid for the games last year. Yeah. That was always in the back of my mind. My, my worry wasn't about that. My worry was getting enough volunteers. Right. And they well, yeah, that was fun. becoming a problem. Yeah, we had yeah. Peter Eamon on. Uh, yes, I heard that. Yes, yeah. my uh, I know Peter quite well. He um, he's the Reeve, he, the Renfrew the, Reeve. Yeah. Yes, the old Reeve position still holds. He is the uh, town of Renfrew's representative at county council. Normally, the head of council goes the mayor, yeah. but in this case, they have a Reeve. So Peter, he's actually been the past warden. He was a three-term warden as well, so he's very involved in the community. And uh, yeah, when they booked that, I said, "Ooh, I hope it doesn't get canceled." Or I was, I was again, my fear was volunteers. They had they had a good pool of volunteers. They really did. I was very impressed with that. But unfortunately, COVID overshadowed it all. And yeah. like I said, it's better it'd rather be known as a good winter game than the game that was a giant spreader event. <laughs> well, that's just it. And he also said, you know, it was getting to the point where we started having to, you know, cut some checks, right? And yeah. um, so, it was just not a time to be cutting checks for games that are probably going to be canceled anyway. So Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the, you know, they'll be rescheduled. It's not like that. It do, doesn't... I, it doesn't sound like you have to like rebid for it or anything like no, that. No, no, that's the thing. It's um, it's it's a good it's, it's a good um, uh, system. It's almost like a feeder for some of the minor leagues when you're going to uh, baseball. You have a triple A, double A, single A, and in this case, it's it's a good feeder system. Get the young out. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, there's yeah. always next year. Yeah. So, so what's, what else is the big news up the line this week there? Do you want COVID or non-COVID really? Well, so let's start with the COVID. <laughs> sure. Yeah. What's going well, on? Well, our front page, our acting director of medical health, Dr. Cushman, lashed out at the people who are abusing our, our uh, health care workers. Very small right. minority, but he's had enough of it. I mean, he's getting reports back of uh, workers not wanting to come do their shift because they're tired of being you know, yelled at or physically abused by uh, patients um, and family and visitors and so on, and he says there's no room for that in, in, in anywhere, in the county, but there's no room for that, so he really lashed out. What they can do to stop it, I don't know. I mean, you just trust that people use their common sense and understand the situation, but people react to stress differently, and yeah. so it, it, it is frustrating. It really is. I know yeah. people are very short-tempered these days, and even in the Valley, people are getting short-tempered. <laughs> so we have 600, as of yesterday, we have 655 active cases, Wow. We had a couple more deaths last week, a total of 15. And, uh, they, What's the situation in the hospitals? What are you hearing about the hospitals and the Valley uh, hospitals? Well, they're holding steady. Um, they have 
right now we have four uh, individuals in the intensive ICU unit. Uh, the beds are getting filled up. I went to, <clears throat> excuse me, my uh, friend of mine went to a hospital in Renfrew uh, last week, and they were in and out in two hours. So it wasn't that bad. Um, but it depends on when you go, right? I said, to, I said, go at 2 o'clock in the morning, you have better luck. So they did. <laughs> and, right. uh, but the hospitals are not filling up. The ICUs, actually, we only have, I think, if I remember correctly, Randy Penny, the former CEO of Renfrew Hospital, told me that they had only four ventilators in all the county. So they would send to, ten, send, to send people yeah. down to Ottawa. Send people to so, Ottawa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. But uh, it's 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 all hands on deck again, unfortunately, and just keep going. The numbers, the cases. I know we had thirty nine the other, or, sorry, one hundred thirty nine the other day. So it's really rocking. We had one hundred and thirty nine cases for Renfrew. Uh, oh, sorry, active. We have sorry, we have one day we had two hundred eighty nine cases. That was last week. That was our okay. Peak. And uh, it's been slowly. Um, the numbers have not gotten that high, but it's been high for us. You know, really something we're not used to. So that's 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 where we are with that, and. Uh, you know, the, the townships are still trying to get through uh, muddling along. I know that Bonisher Valley still hasn't introduced their vaccination uh, mandate. I know one employee personally that was let go from a township. He worked in a, uh, a landfill site, and he's refusing to get vaccinated, and uh, they let him go, and, then, and they're calling him back the next day because the person didn't show up for work. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's that, that's going to start to boil over. I think you're going to start seeing now people who have been dismissed or terminated, they're going to... Interesting to see what's going to happen. You know, it's not a lot, very few, and in fact, indeed, but still, it's. It, I think you might see some legal action down the road. Oh yes, this the lawyer. The lawyers will be busy. Um, They're always busy. What, what, what's uh, what's the buzz with schools? Back to school on Monday. In class learning on Monday. Anxious, very anxious. Okay. It, uh, the the biggest concern they have is not so much the schools; it's the school buses. Um, children located all, all together in one bus, and as well, you have the staff who are driving the bus. They tend to be older gentlemen and women. A lot of them part-time gig. Uh, yeah. They might be farmers or something, and their sure. health is concerned of them. Oh yeah. And I, yeah. I know last year when it was peaking, they had trouble getting all the drivers to fill the buses. So it's um, when, when you see. I know some of the school buses routes may have to be uh, shortened, downsized. Um, the days of the bus running up and down the road twice a day might be over. Maybe just be once a day. And we do have the dwindling population as well. The school population is not getting any bigger. It's getting smaller. So you're having to, have to stretch your buses out even further. So, But, again, the concern I heard from the teachers was the school buses um, because it's not ventilated and it's, they're in close quarters. So that's a that's concern. Okay. All right. Yeah, I like the big city where you walk to school. You don't, They walk to school right, right. too, but not, not from far. <laughs> no, I don't imagine. I don't imagine. And there's homeschooling. People are doing more homeschooling. Uh, okay. They're already, already doing it, so you have that. So um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a mishmash. Okay, what else you got? What else you got? Well, as I mentioned this morning, the oval. Um, oh, the oval. Hard, yeah. Okay. For those hardy enough to get out there at minus thirty five, like I was this morning, <laughs> get out there and do some skating. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> there was one uh, one uh, one person out there. Her name is Kate Whittle. She's a barber in town. Uh, Grandma Kate. She was out there skating around. So God bless her. So she was doing well, and I, I kind did, of a like, did you make somebody angry at the Eganville leader that that was your assignment today? Um, no, I went on my own volition. <laughs> your own volition? Oh, my gosh, you're dedicated to the craft. I took Clancy, and away we went. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, for the listeners out there, if you want a, a, a kind of a different story, you may have seen it. It's on page two of, our, uh, of the issue. It um, talks about a young lady who died a couple of years ago. She was waiting a heart transplant. I'm in your girl. Yes. And they drove, they removed from Hardwood Lake, which is rural, rural, to downtown Toronto because they'd be on standby in case a heart became available. And unfortunately, she collapsed and died in Toronto. So the family moved back to the farm, and her father wrote a book about her experience. And I got a quick little glimpse of the book, and oh my, two pages, I was, I was almost crying. <laughs> you know, but it just talks about her faith and her resilience and her clinging to childhood and you know dealing with an adult-sized problem as a 12 or 14-year-old girl is... And just the way she just died, just suddenly, it's just devastating for the family and the community. They're very well known in the community, and a sad story. But it, it's her father said it's you know it's he wanted to tell her story through a book. So it's so, uh, the listeners are out there and want to get a different kind of read. You know, contact the office, and we can set you up with the with a copy of that. Okay. Um, last week when you were with us, you were talking about um, it was pretty bad in Pickwaganagon. Uh, yes. Did they? And you were speculating they they might. Because they've done it before, they just shut her down, right? You're not allowed um, in or out yeah. if you're not from there. Um, they are. 
what, what's still going open. on? They're still open. They're still yeah. open. Actually, I'll probably going up there. I'm going up there today if I like, get the timing right. Um, just to take a peek around. Plus, I want to get some cheap gas. I'm tired of paying a dollar forty four. Um, right. Yeah, is that and, what it is up there? Dollar forty four because it's a dollar forty four in town here too. So it went up. It went up overnight. It's, yeah, it went uh, up overnight. Okay. Yeah, it was dollar thirty four, thirty seven. That's buck forty four. I know the uh, Pickawaka is a dollar twenty eight, so I'll be going there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm going to find out what's going on it. as far as um, they're staying open. Right now, they are open, but. Uh, I'm going to talk to the chief as well to see Chief Jocko to see if there's any been developments as far as the uh, containing the outbreak. They've done a good job of containing. It. I haven't heard anything, so that's good news, you know. Yeah. So, and, um, it's 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 all it's all over, it's everywhere. <laughs> I was just looking yeah. at something on the road here. Yeah. No, that's okay, Bruce. I'm just looking at uh, your your want ads here. Your oh, help yeah. wanted. Um, free transportation to COVID-19 vaccination clinics in Renfrew County. Um, and then it lists them all, are, you know, the uh, McNabb Seniors at Home Program, Renfrew and Area Seniors, and all the, uh, all the phone numbers are there. So if people are in, uh, in the valley, uh, everything here from Pembroke to, to Deep River to Renfrew, um, Brayside, Eganville, uh, all the phone numbers are listed there if you need a ride. You know, to a vaccination yeah. clinic. I'm not. Who, I'm not sure who's providing that service, but uh, I'm not sure either. But it's a great service because around here we do not have a mass transit. We don't have LRT. Well, you don't have LRT either. But um, <laughs> he, yeah. uh, and it even uh, it's even um, that they're offering accessible transportation. So uh, if yeah. you know if you uh, do require uh, assistance with wheelchairs and whatnot, and also they're looking for COVID-19 screener coordinators on a part-time contract basis. Uh, they say the contract would end uh, at the latest March 31st. Uh, oh, this yeah. is for the County of Renfrew for Bonashir Manor. Yes, that's a long-term care home. Long-term in care home, yep. And it pays yep. almost 30 bucks an hour. Uh, really? Tw- starts at twenty five to twenty nine dollars an hour, but it do- it is explicit no benefits. It says <laughs> no benefits. I should, okay. I should walk up there and put an application right. and go until March. I can use some extra coin. Regular regulated healthcare practitioner must have completed uh, vulnerable sector check, like a background Done. check. Um, <laughs> skills in English, second language, and asset uh, ability to use Word. You can use Word, I, I suspect. Bruce. So. Yes. <laughs> so there may be there may be a calling for me there. I, I'll, I'll pick up some I'll pick up some great okay. stories. People right. want to talk. All right. Twenty five to twenty nine dollars an hour. Okay. And um, today's the deadline for applications. Four o'clock oh. this afternoon. Four o'clock I this can make afternoon. It. I can make it. <laughs> all right. Look, Bruce. Great to hear from you. All the best. You too, Rob. Okay. Take care this yep. weekend. By all means. Safe travels. Warm. Safe travels, and uh, stay warm with the weather that's on the way. You betcha. Yeah, talk to you soon. Uh, from the Eganville Leader, that's Bruce McIntyre uh, driving around Renfrew right now. 11-18, we'll talk about sports. Hey, there was a Senators game last night, and they won. <laughs> Steve Warren with uh, a review of last night's Sens game and a look ahead to this weekend, Wild Card Weekend, for the National Football League. Rob Snow Show, City News.
Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. In sports, let's welcome back Steve Warren. Sense Nation podcast, SenseNationHockey.com. Morning, Steve. Good morning, Rob. Up late last night? I was up late last yeah, night. What were you doing? I watched a little Sens action. Not a bad performance yeah, by don't the locals. Say. There was a Senators game last night. <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow. That? And they actually won with Matt Murray and goal. Will wonders ever see, Steve. Um, what did you think of the game? It surprised me. I'll be honest. I figured they'd be like a dog off the leash energy-wise because they've been off for so long. They've been practicing and practicing, playing some three-on-three uh, trying as best they can to keep the compete level up. And so I'm sure they were anxious to get out there. So I fully expected a uh, really energetic performance. But what I did not expect was how sharp they were. They look like a team that's in midseason form, like things were going along nicely, thought they were really crisp with their passes, and the result speaks for itself. So I was surprised from that perspective. And you can't – I'd also say I'm surprised that Matt Murray was as good as he was. He looked like a guy that – the very guy that they signed from Pittsburgh and, and you know, signed to a massive contract. This is the Matt Murray that sends fans have been clamoring for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fool me once, I guess, when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> Can he do it twice? Let's see. Um, so Edmonton next, I guess, is it? Uh, sa- Saturday, tomorrow night, late, late hockey night in Canada game, I guess. Hopefully, fingers yeah. crossed. Is that still a go? It's still a go, yeah. Still the go. Oilers, okay. they were supposed to play that game on Monday. And they moved it to this weekend because the Oilers had their own outbreak. So not only are the Oilers going to this game ice cold, uh, I think they're like 2-11, and 11, but they're coming off COVID as well. And not just a sort of a rescheduling because of capacity limits. No, they had an outbreak as well. So it'll be interesting to see what their energy levels are like going into this game. Okay. How are they going to make up all these games, Steve? Like the Sens are, have played the fewest games in the league. How are they going to make those games up? Or are, do you think they'll even make them up they made we had Wayne Scanlon on from Sportsnet um, earlier in the week and he said you know what they're so far out of it the league might just kind of prorate prorate them (laughs) (laughs) well I don't see that happening I I think it'll be a challenge but I think they'll be able to do it because you look at I mean remember the original NHL schedule had zero games in February for the most part February 6th to the 22nd was supposed to be the Olympic break well now they don't need it they're not sending players to Beijing. So the league itself has 17 days where they can reschedule games because the Sens aren't the only team with this problem. If you look at the Sens schedule, their original schedule, they had a 24-day window of nothing. Their original schedule was a game on February 1st and then nothing until the 26th. So I think with a 24-day window, they should be able to make up most of the games that uh, they need to make up. I think it's 12 at the moment, but it's going to be very busy. Not much time off for the for the club. So if you've been complaining about lack of Sens hockey, and you certainly have a right to, you're going to get more than your fill of Sens hockey over the next three and a half months because <laughs> they're going to be going pretty much every other night the rest of the way. Okay. All right. It's wild card weekend in the National Football League. <laughs> Well, here we go, Steve. Playoffs. The playoffs. The playoffs. Uh, here are the winners. These are my predictions. Bengals, Bills, Bucks, Cowboys, Chiefs, and Rams. Well, those will be the winners of Wild Card Weekend. But what, uh, uh, what do you think? What's the game to watch? What's the game to watch, in your opinion, Steve? Well, let me first say that I've got exactly the same lineup as you. All home teams, as you do. Uh, except for that uh, last game on Monday night. I got Arizona beating the Rams. But the game, I mean, they're all great, aren't they? I mean, six amazing matchups. Yeah, good games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's really nothing in there. Well, I'm not sure how. Look, I love Big Ben. Uh, Amazing that the Steelers made the playoffs. Like, you know, they should be kissing the Indianapolis Colts. Like, it's just amazing that the Steelers are even in. But, um this is Ben's last game. This is Big Ben's last game. Like, they're not going to win. They don't have a chance against the Chiefs. So. Oh, there's no question. I mean, that's that's by far the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest underdog situation. I mean, Pittsburgh needed Jacksonville to upset the Colts, I think, on the final weekend to get into the playoffs. Yeah. They're lucky to be there. There's oh, no yeah. question. Yeah. But when you ask me about matchups, you know, I mean, I'm still going to – there's so much heritage. There's the Steelers and the Chiefs. 
just a neat matchup. Yeah. Uh, I fully expect Kansas City to to run away with that game by the second half. But the Steelers, you never know. Never know. They're, 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 there's yeah. always a team that seems to hang around in that second half. So, yeah, I, I think absolutely that's the one game where you'd probably circle as your number one. If you had to bet on one team straight up, no spread, uh, to win a game, it'd certainly be the Chiefs this weekend. All right. You think the Bills are for real? You think that, like, could they go deep, you think? Yeah, I certainly think saying? they're good. I think they're good for this weekend. And the neat little nugget I'll give you about New England at Buffalo is the rookie quarterback stat. Because rookie quarterbacks since 2010 in the NFL playoffs are 0-6. It is a big ask of Mac Jones for the Patriots to go into Buffalo in enemy territory for his first playoff game. And by the way, they say it's going to be one of the coldest games in NFL history. They're saying minus 18 Celsius, (laughs) minus 23 wind chill. I mean, can you imagine... Anyway, I do think Buffalo is for real. Um, Josh Allen can beat you with his arm. He can beat you. I mean, he's he's such a great runner as well. Um, so I, I really feel like Buffalo, just given the inexperience on the New England side, Tom Brady is long gone. Uh, so I, I like the Bills to win that game. Can they go deep? I think the Chiefs are probably the team that stands in their way. Yeah, okay. Well, I know what I'm doing this weekend. It's going to be freezing cold and then a snowstorm on Monday. So it's... It's football. It's football weather. Oh, I mean, right. football I, and then hockey, Steve. It's great, right? I, I would say the Sens in the playoffs. So the only thing that gets me as excited is NFL playoffs. Yeah. Enjoy it. We'll talk next week, Steve. Thanks so much. You too, Rob. Yep. Thanks. Steve Warren, Sens Nation podcast, SensNationHockey.com. Queens Park, week in review, our MPPs debate back to school on Monday. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. FM and 1310 AM. This is Friday, the 14th of January. Good morning, I'm Jason White. Right now in Ottawa and Smith Falls, an extreme cold warning in effect. Mainly sunny, minus 17, feeling like minus 28 in the wind in Ottawa. It's minus 15 in Smith Falls with a wind chill of minus 23. Here's what's making news this hour. Five people remain missing after yesterday's massive explosion at a tanker truck manufacturer in Nepean. But police say they do not expect to find any survivors in the rubble. Three men were taken to hospital after the blast on Maryville Road, south of Hunt Club. 
Police say one of the men died this morning. A second man remains in stable condition. The third has now been sent home. Police say the explosion site is heavily damaged. The investigation continues. The number of people in Ontario hospital intensive care units with COVID-19 rising today by 27, now 527 patients in total. There are also 42 more deaths attributed to the virus today. Immunocompromised Ontarians can book appointments for their fourth dose of a COVID vaccine starting today. Officials say people who are moderately to severely immunocompromised can book a fourth dose starting through this provincial contact center. The Snowshoe Fund 50-50 draw has a winner, Jacob Adams of Cars. The young man says he plans on sharing his newfound wealth with the person at work who suggested he buy a ticket. His take, more than $409,000. The other half goes to the Snowshoe Fund to help keep Ottawa kids warm this winter. City News Time 1132. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, much ground to cover off because it's uh, been a very busy week when it comes to government action uh, and the pandemic. So it's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. And uh, let's welcome back everybody here. Uh, Gilles Besson, New Democrat, Timmins. Hi, Gilles. Bonjour from the cold white north. Oui, il fait froid. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Let me see here. Just let me get my weather uh, app open here. In Ottawa, minus 18 feels like minus 28. What are you uh, there? Uh, Add 20 Uh, degrees. (laughs) No way. Really? Well, what's minus 38? Yeah. Minus 38. Yep. Okay. Keep it there. Keep. <laughs> uh, it's, it's wonderful. We we love this tropical weather. Uh, yeah, it's tropical. Uh, John Fraser, Liberal MPP. Oh, i uh, Ottawa South. John. John. Okay. How are you? How are, I'm good, John. How are you? I'm great. Staying warm, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm staying warm. Good. And uh, Donna Skelly. Good Flamborough, morning. Glenbrook, Progressive Conservative. In uh, southern Ontario, where it's probably balmy and not even... It is like, balmy, minus five. Minus Ooh, five. Oh, wouldn't you? you take that right about now? <laughs> Who needs Cuba? All right. Uh, okay. Um, what are you paying for gas, Shield? It's getting up there again, like a dollar forty-four around town here now. A dollar fifty-two, a dollar... dollar fifty-two? Okay, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. John, you're a miser when it comes to gas. You get any cheap gas lately, or um, no? I no, I, I, no. I'm, I'm down to a quarter tank. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. <laughs> and just across oh. the street, it's like a dollar forty-four point three. Dollar forty-four. Petrol can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. You fill up lately, Donna? I did. I filled up yesterday, and it was uh, I filled up about a dollar forty. But $1. you can 40. get it still about a dollar thirty-eight, thirty-nine here. Wait, 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 what about what about like you? Your government was supposed to save me money on gas. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We're trying. Like, was that a stretch goal? Stretch no, goal, it's not a stretch goal. If, if, if Mr. Fraser's laughing, ask his federal counterpart how great that oh. carbon tax is. You think it's oh. bad now? It's not just affecting the price of gas. Wait until it really um, uh, plays out in terms of the cost of food. I think it was uh, shopping this week, and I picked up three peppers, $8.00. Oh, there are entire sections of the grocery store I don't even visit anymore, Donna. It's crazy. And um, some shelves, a lot of empty shelves. <laughs> like, you know, like I go by um, the meat section and there are cuts of meat that I used to be able to afford. I'm, mid- uh, you know, earning a decent middle class income. I just keep moving. Um, we have to eat bologna again. I grew up you know, on bologna. I love bologna. bologna. No, I bologna's like fine. Bologna. You know, no, no, I'm not making light of it, but I mean, it's, it it's, true. um, Rob, sorry, I'm, John, I'm go ahead, John. Guy. Yeah. I'm an old grocery guy. Yeah. And now's the time for cherry picking. And you can, now's the time pick, for what? Cherry picking. Cherry, cherry picking, which means yeah. you look at every flyer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the time. Yeah. I don't know, John. I mean, our our news anchor Andrew Boyle is a real flyer guy, and he said there there are no deals in the flyers anymore. There are no big screaming deals. On the right now, so See what you happens go. when Tories and Liberals come to power. The price of groceries. Oh yeah, because <laughs> you know, new, new de- know. yeah, what New Democrats are there. famous for cut, for lowering the cost of living for everyone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Could you imagine? Yeah, it was back in the '90s. They did that. Oh no, they didn't. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
Let's talk about back to school. There was information, of course, released this week by the education minister and um, the chief medical officer of health. I want to start with the uh, opposition MPPs first. Jill, you can go first. How confident are you in the safety of the classrooms of Timmins? Well, I think there's a lot of concern. I've been uh, fielding calls, as we all have, from constituents. Uh, the bottom line is everybody wants the kids to go back, almost everybody. I wouldn't say everybody, but most people do. Uh, most students want to go back. Teachers want to go back. Trustees want the classes reopened. So we're all on the same page when it comes to that. But there's some, you know, there's some, some issues. Uh, the good news is uh, I've confirmed with our board that the N95 masks have finally arrived along with the uh, cloth mask, so that's going to help. I think the big question is uh, the reporting process and the size of classes. The fact that parents are not going to find out unless they go looking uh, what the uh, situation is with COVID in their schools it really leaves a lot to be desired. You that, know that that thirty percent rule. That thirty percent. That okay. that's a head scratcher for a lot of people. They're saying, listen, yeah. you know that that I'm going to have to go look on the website to find out if my kid's school is at thirty percent or whatever it is, ten uh, percent, whatever, uh, is going to be problematic. And the second thing is class sizes. So. You know, the, the government has created a lot of confusion, uh, and I think that confusion is leading to anger amongst a number of parents. And I know I've been called. There are parents that are not going to send their kids to school because they don't feel uh, that the kids are going to be safe. So I think a couple of things should be done. One, uh, class sizes should be lower. And number two, we should do actual reporting of the numbers because parents need to know that. Okay. Now, John, I had, uh, uh, do you know Tom D'Amico, the director of education yeah. at the Catholic Board? So I spoke with him yesterday. Uh, they have 83 schools in the Catholic Board, English Catholic Board here in Ottawa. And I asked him how many have, have had uh, major upgrades to their HVAC systems, and he told me every single one of them. Every single one of them, John. Big bucks, like $50,000 each, you know, for HVAC upgrades. Mm -hmm. So uh, this idea that, you know, the filtration in the schools and this, it's not safe. Um, you know, the, the Catholic board, every school's been done, John. Every school. Well, well not, not, not all boards are equal, and you can see mm -hmm. sort of what's happened across the province. And that's good to hear that. I think that's very reassuring for parents. That's the kind of information they need to know. Uh, that hasn't been forthcoming. That just hasn't been forthcoming uh, up until this crunch that we're in right now. And you know, I, I said this before. You know, look, this isn't easy, uh, but we should have been more ready and help those boards and schools that are struggling uh, to get these things done. You know, by, by getting things to them. Uh, and I think what every parent wants to know. Look, I've, I've got three grandchildren. I, I I'm anxious about it, but I'm right. uh, you know I, I have some confidence in our educators. Okay. Uh, what but, do you think you about know, this just, thirty percent rule, John? Well, look, I, I'm trying to figure out what the government's trying to report, because what they said at the news conference is we're not reporting. And then two hours later, they said we're going to report. So n now they're going to report the positive PCR tests. And so I think what parents want to know is I want to know what's going on in my classroom. But more importantly, I want to know that you know what you're doing and have some confidence in what you're communicating to me. All right. And so, you know, you spend a week saying we're not reporting anything, and then you say it at your news conference announcing it, and then two hours later, or not even two hours later, you're saying, no, well, we are reporting. Okay. So, communica uh, like uh, Donna, the communications yeah. challenges, uh, it seems, is what your colleagues here are questioning. So, I'd say it's a coronavirus challenge. Uh, John, 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 we wouldn't be in this mess if your government hadn't left us with schools that were absolutely out of date, needed a lot of money to improve. I mean, it was the previous government that made a mess and left us in a mess with long-term care facilities, a health care system that was underfunded, and an educational system that had been neglected. But let's talk about the testing. First of all, every parent that wants to know uh, how many people are absent from their school can go online on a daily basis and that, that is being tracked. As you know, this particular vi variant is um, uh, playing out in the terms of, of absenteeism. So those numbers will be tracked and they'll be made available to parents on a daily basis through the school boards who are collecting that data. That, they can go on and if they feel that the absentee rate in their, their student's school or classroom is too high, they don't have to send their child or they can. It's up to them. But that information is available to them. We are applying this, these new metrics because um, 
we've changed the way that we are utilizing our PCR testing. And this is the best way through absenteeism to track how widespread mm. this variant is. And as I said, it's going to be updated on a daily basis. And anybody that wants to know can simply go online, Ontario.ca slash coronavirus, and find that information. Parents, we've talked about this before, about the safety of schools. You said you spoke to, um, Rob, you spoke to one of the directors of the Catholic yeah, Board Tom Danico, Director of Education, every Ottawa Catholic. Every school board in the province has had improved ventilation. Not every school requires a HEPA filtration system, but they all have one. And every school is tested regularly. Their ventilation system is tested, and that data is posted and made public for any parent or anybody that wants to know whether or not their school or, or the, uh, the data that is collected in terms of the safety of the ventilation system in that particular school. We are doing everything humanly possible. The N95 masks have arrived. Back, go back to the beginning of the pandemic. And we were left in a situation where Ontario's manufacturing sector had been decimated by the previous government. They created an environment that where companies didn't want to to operate, so they left Ontario. We had to, and the Premier said at the time, we'll never be caught in this situation again. Uh, today, 70% of PPE N95s are now being manufactured in Ontario. We want 100% and we're working towards it, but we are playing catch up from being left in the mess that we are in. I am very confident the kids will be returning to a school that is as safe as we can humanly possibly make it and everything that can be done is being done. Yeah. Well, I think that a lot of people will disagree with you. You know, I think that the fact that we're not reporting the amount of cases in actual schools when it comes to infections is problematic for parents. How are you going to do that, though, Joe? How are you no, going to do that with the system? Hang on, my turn. I listen to you. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 what parents are telling us, and you're getting the same phone calls that we are, is that they want to know how many infections are there in the school where my child goes because that is one of the things that they're going to decide. You know, we, we have a situation in Ontario where if one child has lice and is sent home, every parent in that classroom finds out that they have lice for one incident. We're going to wait till there's 30% uh, infection before we tell publicly students and, and parents what's well, going on Well, absenteeism, as from, that, not necessarily that, infection, but absenteeism, right? Ab yeah, but absenteeism, it could be a whole, whole bunch of different things. Well, it could be I, a whole bunch. I have people that are absent in my, in my workplace because of different things, uh, a fall, uh, you know, whatever it yeah, might yeah, be yeah, type yeah, of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to make sure that you, you know, it's apples and oranges. You need oranges to call an orange. It is the question of how many infections do you have? Okay. And if, yeah. uh, right. it, so, I think that is one so of the things that... Go ahead, John. People. Go ahead. Jo jump yeah. in there, John. So, yeah. so, so, Donna, you know, uh, the defense of uh, blaming everything on the last people uh, really doesn't answer the question about communications. And the reality is the reason that you're not communicating well is because we weren't ready. So N95 oh, masks, the N95 masks have been called on for months now. They've been asking for that for educators and quality masks for kids the same thing not just us everybody the same thing with rapid tests the same thing on childhood vaccinations so all i'm simply saying is every parent wants to know these things so, so john let me ask does, you does the, do, does the person just a sec don child is that person vaccinated and are the children around them vaccinated does everyone have access to a high quality mask is the yes. ventilation good Yes. And are people going to communicate to me with what's happening in the classroom? Yes. Now, we could debate what happened over 15 years, and I can have a good debate with you because I know what happened. But right now we're talking about what you need to tell parents to give them confidence. And what I'm trying to say is you're not doing a good job at Just it. Just take out any and Auditor General's report from the last 15 years, pick any page, and you'll know what happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Donna, sorry, John. Uh, yeah, so, you go, yeah. Bob. But you, you, go. You, got, you guys ran against Mike Harris for a decade, so, you know. <laughs> Turn around is fair play. Yeah, but it's so much um, easier to run against Kathleen Wynn. And, okay. And, um, a, a, quick, a, a quick response to what your colleagues have said, and then we'll stop and we'll come back. I do want to ask you about uh, what they're doing in Quebec with taxes. So um, uh, I, go ahead, I, Donna. I just have to say that it's so easy to criticize, but we are doing everything we possibly can, possibly can. You called for N95 masks. We had to manufacture them. We have been working 
24-7 to make sure that our schools are safer. There, the ventilation system in every school in the province is better today. No, that's today. not true. The, no, that's all not right, true. All right, all right, all right. 25% One of at a time, Jill, 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 Jill. Come on, come on. Come on, Jill. Let her finish. Let her finish. Yeah. Go ahead. But I, I want to just talk about the, the metrics that we are using to track um, COVID cases. We cannot have PCR labs, PCR tests and, and labs at the uh, disposal of every child in Ontario 24-7. We have a limited number of these tests and resources. We are allocating them uh, as best we can. And the only way we can now track, um, the most efficient way to track the this virus spreading in our schools is through the absentee rate and that information is available with one click away every day right. for parents. Okay, That's look, you can, we, lo- we have to stop. We can respond to that after we come back, and I do want your take on the anti-vax tax in Quebec. Rob Snow, Show City News. An old-fashioned, traditional grocery store. You're going to find a butcher, okay? You want a steak cut a certain way, you're going to get it. You know, there's flour piled in the warehouse. There's mixers on the floor, there's flour on the floor. Uh, the bakery is rented out to Frank Niccolo. It's him and his son come in at night. They mix the dough, they roll the dough, and they bake the dough. It's not the traditional uh, frozen and thaw and put it in the, in the bin, okay? It's made from scratch seven days a week. It's probably the only bakery left in Ottawa that does that. You know, then customer service. You know, we're, we're, we're big on that. The, uh, the cashiers, the, the deli, you're, you're not, if so, you ask for something, they're not going to point, it's an aisle number seven, they're going to bring you there, okay? If you have too much groceries out, we'll take it out to your car, you know what I mean? There's nothing we don't do for our customers, and we evolved around our customers. They would come in and say, you know, can you try getting me this, you know, can you get me this? So that's how we built the lineup we have now, okay? So we have a lot of unique items that someone that, uh, came over to you know live in Canada hasn't seen this particular product but we sourced it and we have it for them that you know like something they used to have as a kid we have a lot of those unique items a lot you know uh, from Germ- like all over the world and we source it through you know uh, distributors in Montreal and Toronto that bring in the product in bulk and we piggyback off of them probably the uh, the largest European deli in Ottawa we we're, we, we sell lots because people buy lots. Nothing really complicated about that. You know, we turn over a lot of product. You know, we package it properly. We buy, and we're always uh, consistent. You know, you're always going to buy, you know, Cuddy turkey breast. You know, San Daniel Mortadella. You're always going to get the same brands. We don't flip back and forth to save 20 cents. It's always the same brands the last 29 years best sandwiches in town. It's simple. It starts off with fresh bread every day baked in the store. Anything that's left over goes to breadcrumbs. So you're getting a fresh bun every day that was baked probably four hours before you get here. Okay. Not only baked, made, like, you know, mix the flour, roll the dough, proof the bread and bake the bread. Okay. Then all the ingredients come right off the shelves. You know, your lettuce, your tomatoes, all your condiments, and they're cut up fresh in the deli not like the big you know, ch- corporate restaurant chains that your lettuce comes in shredded in the bag, you open it up and you throw it in the bin. You know, takes you know, two or three days to get here from California. How long is it in the bag? The big difference is like making a sandwich at home and you don't have to do the work. It's really what the trick is and using the freshest ingredients possible. With Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay. So we are back with our MPPs, Gilles Bissant, John Fraser, Donna Skelly. Uh, Quebec Premier Francois Legault vows uh, to move ahead with his anti vax tax. Now, Premier Ford this week was asked about an anti vax tax, a tax on the unvaccinated. This is what Premier Ford said. 
I mean, no, we're, we're taking a different approach. Uh, we aren't going down that road. We're, we're going to take a different approach. But I implore, I ask, I beg, every single person that's not vaccinated, please uh, protect yourself, protect your family, protect co-workers. Please get your vaccination. Okay. Uh, that's right. the, the best uh, way we can defend against uh, Omicron. Thank you, Alex. The, that's the good. Variants. So. Uh, John, let's start with you this time. John Fraser, Liberal MPP. Should we have a uh, tax just for the unvaccinated? What's your opinion, John? No, I, 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 uh, I agree with the Premier on that part of it. I don't think that, um, I think the approach that we have to take is uh, one that starts with carrots, and that's because, and continues with carrots, because, you know, the situation is one or two percent of people who are anti-vaxxers, and it's a political statement more than a public health statement. And there's seven, eight, nine percent of people who um, are genuinely either vaccine hesitant, resistant. There's some procrastinators in there. And so we have to get people information. And uh, there has to be um, more of a public education campaign than we see right now uh, on all media channels. You know, I think, with, for instance, with the five to 11 year old vaccines, uh, we really do need to see something there. Uh, there um, there's a lot of misinformation. Okay. Like an incredible amount of misinformation, and um, and governments have to counter that. Okay. You know, something like five hundred or six hundred anti-vax websites. There's mm-hmm. all these conspiracy theories out there, sure. and um, and it, all it takes is somebody sending an email that says that um, something happened to a child in a vaccination clinic. That was totally untrue. There was one circulating here in Ottawa hmm. about something that happened in Barhead, and that was totally untrue. Okay, Jill. So, what do, what, 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 so, so, um, Jill. What do you think on a, a a tax for the unvaccinated? Jill or Donna? Yeah, Jill. Go ahead, oh, Jill. Okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. I thought you said Donna. Yeah, uh, listen, I think Legault is trying to. I, first of all, I don't agree. I agree with the premier. Uh, that position, we can we can uh, be on the same side. Uh, but I think what Legault is trying to hit into is that there's a lot of people out there, and you've heard it all, because mm-hmm. we talk to constituents on a daily basis. There are people that are upset that they've done everything that they have to do. Yeah. They physically distance, they wear a mask, they get vaccinated, they got their booster shot, and there are people out there running around not being vaccinated, uh, which is, in their eyes, causing a lot of the problems that we have today. So that's what Legault is, is tapping into, uh, that, that resentment on the part of those who've done what they had to do and stepped up, are saying, you know, why should we be penalized uh, because of what they're doing? And that's what Legault is doing. Now, I don't agree with this as you don't a, agree with I'm it? with John and I'm All with right. the Premier and okay. Donna when it comes to you're better off offering a carrot than hitting people with a stick. All you right. gotta you know, the reality is is that we live in a liberal society and I don't mean liberal and uh, L liberal party <laughs> liberal, no, no, no. but we live in a in an open society where you can make your choices and we need to respect that. Okay. Sounds like we're going to sing Kumbaya here, Donna. Well, I got the words in the sheet. I'll hand it out. Where's Yakabuski when you when you need him? Okay. Um, Again, it's and and that is the truth. If you look at the numbers, we have 91 percent of our population right now over the age of 11 have uh, received their first dose. 88 percent second dose. We're leading in booster shots. We're leading in in these first doses. But even after Quebec announced this tax, uh, 7,000 Quebecers received their first booster or their first shot, their first vaccination, but without it, 9,000 Ontarians. So it's, it's, you know, people don't need that. I don't think it's the way to encourage people to Mm -hmm. to get their shot. I think it's about telling them that if we want to get through this, you have to, you know, it's information, accurate information. I agree with John. There's an awful lot of inaccurate information. We just have to uh, spread... um, the message that it's, it's the way we'll get through this. Okay. So Look, just, uh, uh, sorry, John. One quick uh, thing, Rob. Yeah. We, we're, we're under 50% in, at the back of the pack in provinces for 5 to 11-year-olds. Yes, we are. And all of yeah. us, we have to do yeah. a lot of work to get it there. Well, vaccinating and, uh, in schools will help. There's no yeah. question. Yes. We've been calling on and, that for uh, a while. It's important. Okay. Government okay. is moving okay. in that okay. direction, and we're glad they okay. got okay. the Okay. Okay. Very quickly, just on, just on that. Um, Let's play the Dr. Kieran Moore raised a few eyebrows this week. Mm. Uh, play the clip, uh, Alex, if you will. He was asked, uh, why aren't we mandating, you know, make it part of the, uh, the COVID vaccine, make it part of the childhood vaccination program in the schools? Go ahead, Alex, play the clip, please. Have they not been mandated in schools? 
So it is a new vaccine, uh, and as a result of that, we um, want a greater experience with it before we'd ever mandate it. And I don't think any jurisdiction uh, in Canada ha has mandated the virus to date. So, so uh, John, the, the leader of your party, after that was said, said if he doesn't clarify what he means, I would fire him. Uh, and he, later in the day, he clarified what he meant. It's safe, it's effective, strong protection. Please yeah. get it. It's my experience uh, in the news media, whether you're talking to engineers or scientists or medical people, um, it's just a, a generalization. I get it. But off, sometimes they're not great communicators. No, I, Are I, you willing I, I, to let this slide uh, with well, Dr. Look, Moore that, here? Just, uh, yeah, look, I, I think we accept the fact that he, you know, that he corrected that, he did the right thing right away. Because the first word out of everybody's mouth as far as childhood vaccines go is they're safe and effective, very rare events that are very mild. And we need to get our children vaccinated. That should be the first thing anybody says about it. This should be the first thing that he said. Now, there is not still not clarity around um, um, the universal vaccines in schools. And uh, and I think that that's a really important part of us actually communicating to parents yeah. that they're safe and effective. And, um, and I, you know, I, I have to say, I wasn't satisfied with his response yesterday. You weren't satisfied? Uh, no? Okay. No, I was, no, I was satisfied with his retraction. But yesterday, you know, they were saying, well, you know, we just, you know, we, you know, we just can't do this right now. And the thing is, well, we're going to do it. That's okay. the message. A quick 20 seconds from uh, each of you on that, please. A quick 20 seconds well, on each he, of you from that. I think he added the confusion that people feel about what the government has been doing. There's mixed messages. And I don't think that was helpful. He retracted. Good for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, it just adds well, to the Well, clarified. 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 Yeah, he clarified okay. after. I understand. But yeah. I'm just saying it, it creates Donna? confusion. Donna? He clarified his statement. He is under intense pressure. He's not political. Yeah. But Stephen Del Duca made this political full state. Full stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, have a great weekend. Stay warm. Stay safe, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Hey, Take Queen's, care. Queen's, Queen's Park Week in Review. That's it for the Rob Snow Show. This program is brought to you by...